Well, guess what? We're back home again. It's good to be home. Uh, it was fun playing on the municipal side of the street, but I think that we've got nicer quarters, though their cushy chairs are kind of nice over there. It's not worth uh, sitting through hearings okay. on dogs. And <laughs> For, some know about that. <laughs> For some people, For some people, cushy chairs. I know there are only, there are only five good chairs, and two people sat on hard little wooden chairs, and... Uh, when Judd was absent, it was uh, an advantage one. that he, uh, we had only one member of the committee on painful wooden chairs, but it's good to be back. That's home. good to be back. <laughs> it, it's incredibly hard to run the meeting over there because there's just so much going on and half of what was going, you know, you're paying attention to the superintendent who's way over there and the, you've got members of the committee behind you and you're constantly doing this maneuver. It's, it's good to be home. We have to School. behave ourselves now. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, uh, people aren't going to confuse us with the selectmen. What is the selectmen doing on that? You know? Okay. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is introduce the artwork, which is a pleasure that we have not had because we haven't been in the room with the artwork. And our kids do such great stuff. So we're going to start off with the insect unit uh, from preschool one. Over the course of a few weeks, the preschool students learned about insects through the reading of Eric Carle books. The favorite books from the unit were The Very Hungry Caterpillar and The Very Lonely Firefly. In this display, we also incorporated ladybugs and a flower garden. Different art mediums were used in the making of this display, such as watercolor paints, sequins, and tissue paper. Then... Uh, period preschool for Miss Amy's class did something fishy, which I think is over here. Uh, during our ocean theme, the children were fascinated with the different kinds of fish and treasures found in the ocean. We made our own aquariums by painting the frame made out of a paper plate, gluing foam shapes from the, for the fish and finishing it off with a plastic bag filled with sand and shells. Come discover our adorable creations. Then over in the back, preschool three did an insects unit. Uh, during this unit, we read many books about insects, played with pretend bugs, hiding in the grass and at, in the sensory table, and had ants in our flubber. No uncles. Uh, as the children explored pretend insects, uh, we had live caterpillars doing their work in our butterfly house. We left the encased caterpillars on Friday, and when we returned from Memorial Day weekend, we had butterflies. You can tell how long it's been since we've been here. <laughs> to represent the metamorphos metamorphosis, the children created their own caterpillars and butterflies. Releasing the butterflies into the nearby trees was exciting. We spotted one on the playground a few days later. And then over here, to the right with the yellow background, 10 Little Rubber Ducks. The children enjoyed reading the book, 10 Little <laughs> Rubber Ducks, written by Eric Carl. Each child created their own duck and the wonderful sea animals the ducks encountered during their journey through the book. We used a variety of different materials to create their own delightful ocean scene. That's preschool too. And it's good to be back. The elevator's working. We can now meet here. It was a long, long ride. And, and I think on behalf of the entire committee, we need to recognize the custodians, the mm -hmm. tech people, and everybody who works in this building who needs to haul stuff up and down. Uh, we understand just what, how difficult it is to move things from level one to level six and back again. So... Thank you so very much. We're so appreciative of this. Maybe we can get you a new school. Um, we now go on to public participation and uh, a reminder that we do not comment back at public participation. We listen to you. We have lot three minutes for each speaker. Uh, and Sir Bon Foley uh, is first. Liz Higgins will be next, so be, you know, I think you've seen the list. <coughs> Ms. Foley. We'll just keep sliding this down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you guys going to talk? Okay. Um, so, Siobhan Foley, um, I teach third grade at Thompson, and I'm also the vice president of the union. 
And I am here, um, along with my, some of my colleagues, to introduce the teacher's budget priorities for the coming year. Um, given the shortened time frame, we did not have enough time to take a look at the administration's priorities and really review those closely in accordance with our own. Um, and so we are presenting to you what we were able to come up with in our 10-minute meetings that were held at each building. Mm -hmm. um, a copy will be given to Karen Fitzgerald. So tonight we have Liz Higgins, who's going to discuss the elementary priorities. <coughs> Christine Brayfield is here to discuss the specific priorities around physical education. Uh, Juliana Keyes is going to speak for the middle school. And Valerie Sarazen will speak about the high school budget priorities. So I'm going to let Liz begin. Okay, Liz Higgins, you now have your three minutes. All right. So we have a list um, of five categories, and then number six being miscellaneous. The priorities that we have at the elementary level would be additional teachers and the priority to keep class sizes as low as possible. <laughs> um, more TA support is category number two. More technology support, cat number three. Academic and social emotional support curriculum materials, and more curriculum support, and again, miscellaneous. Um, and to add some details to uh, the TA support would be uh, grade level TAs to stay in the classrooms and not to be pulled as substitutes, mm -hmm. and TAs uh, for larger class sizes not being used to service IEPs. Um, more technology support um, would be, you know, having staff members come in, um, experts coming in to help the kids um, with technology. Also having additional hardware and iPads for each of the elementary schools. Uh, more math support, more comprehension support, more literacy coaches. Um, there's a theme. Mm -hmm. We're needing we, more bodies to help get the job done. Um, the elementary teachers are feeling that it's necessary for every teacher to have their own FOSS science kit mm -hmm. in order to implement the new curriculum. Um, and for re across the curriculum, additional books and more outside experts coming in to provide professional development. And some, in the, some of the things in the miscellaneous would be a key card entrance at all the elementary schools. Mm -hmm sinks in the cafeterias um, of all the elementary schools, modular classrooms specifically for Stratton for music class during <laughs> renovations, and creative seating options, um, so more furniture to support collaboration in the classrooms at the elementary level. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Brayfield. Good evening. My name is Christine Brayfield, and I'm a physical education teacher at Thompson Elementary School. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you tonight on behalf of my elementary PE colleagues. I'm here this evening to address the issue of double gym classes. While there has been the need for a few double gym classes in the past in one or two schools, the combination of the weekly early release time on Tuesday and the enrollment growth have led to a substantial increase in the need to double up and have two gym classes, each with their own teacher, mm -hmm. running simultaneously in the gym. There are currently 33 doubled up gym sessions at the elementary level, with Pierce having the least at one, and Brackett and Dallin having the most at seven apiece. Mm -hmm. While there are good weather days when one class can be outside and the other inside, there are many days of the year when both classes need to share the gym space. The PE teachers have been doing their best to be creative, but having 45 to 59 bodies in one space presents many challenges. <clears throat> Double classes are not ideal for teaching and learning. It has been difficult for us to follow our curriculum because we don't currently have twice the amount of equipment needed to effectively teach each unit in the curriculum. We are being forced to either deviate from our curriculum or have children wait a long time for a turn. Student safety is also another concern. With so many children in the gymnasium at once, there is a higher risk of injury. While we do teach body awareness and appropriate movement within their own personal space, some children have had trouble following these guidelines in the smaller space they have at their disposal with the double classes. 
Whether it is a kindergarten or fifth grade double class, each has its own challenges. Smaller children pose a noise and management issue, along with the difficulty of establishing routines and calm transitions, while fifth graders pose a space and equipment challenge. Many children also have a sensitivity to noise, and no matter how well behaved, 50 students simply make more noise than 25. One PE teacher has even spoken to their principal regarding some sound reducing panels for the gymnasium to help with this issue. <clears throat> I want to close with a request to add additional PE teachers next year, both to meet the increased enrollment and to deal with the early release Tuesday schedule. Technically, there are 43 available teaching blocks during the week if the gym is utilized at all times. But due to the fact that teachers are shared between buildings and there is little wiggle room in the schedules, principals have been forced to go to double sessions. 43 periods with the gym occupied at all times would mean that only the largest school right now, bracket, would have the need for a double session. With more PE FTEs, principals would have more flexibility in how they create their specialist schedules, thus decreasing the need for double sessions. We could really appreciate your support in this area. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Keyes. Hi, everybody. Thanks for the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, the Audison is growing. We, we all know that, and that means we need more staff members. Mr. Ruggieri has requested staff in the core cluster areas as well as exploratory, and we all see the need for those areas. Um, we specifically need more special ed staff, especially in the small group programs, and support for those students when they go into mainstream classes. This has been particularly noticeable this year with the influx of students from G um, Jermaine Lawrence. Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot more of them coming. They need more support in our school. Uh, we have a request um, echoed by many of our teachers that we need a full-time science director, mm -hmm. and that that's not a knock on our current science director, but the position deserves to be full-time. Um, and we particularly need more world language staff because coming into the Audison is the first time that students take a world language in Arlington. Who's what language they want to take? And this year, some kids were told they couldn't take their first choice language mm -hmm. because we didn't have the staffing for that. And that should never happen when you have a kid interested in learning something. Um, other than staff, we'd like to continue with Wi-Fi improvements. It's been kind of a rough year and there's still a few blank spots in the building. And finally, um, we're requesting some security improvements, and this was really highlighted in our Alice drill last year, that we need deadbolts or a quick way to lock the doors that don't involve keys, especially for days when you have a substitute in the classroom or a prep period where a teacher is out of the room when something happens. We need pull down shades on the windows on our doors because if the idea is that there's an intruder in the building and you've got teachers trying to tape a cover over a window, that it, it's just, it feels like we're not taking things seriously, mm -hmm. and we take this very seriously, the safety of our students. Um, and this needs to be done for both the outer doors to the hallway and the interconnecting doors between the classrooms. Mm -hmm. So you know, we want to take this seriously, um, but you know, we think that a lock that can be activated without a key, or even a deadbolt, that, or a, like a, a door stop or deadbolt or something that could stop the door from opening would be very important, mm -hmm. so thank you. With Val Sarazin. Hi, I'm Valerie Sarazin. I am the secretary of the union. I am also a special ed teacher here at the high school. Um, I know this is your first round of listening to um, suggestions or concerns, and the high school is no exception. In fact, the, um, the faculty, the AAM members, are going to be having a meeting tomorrow morning at 7.30 to compile a list of their most uh, uh, current concerns, but some of them actually came forward so far. And it comes down to staff, staff, staff. Mm -hmm. One of the staff areas is actually in the dean's offices, and we're not looking for another dean, but we're looking for full-time secretaries because it's very um, uh, uncomfortable. It's also very frustrating when you go, uh, send a student down to the dean's office or you call up, um, down to the dean's office uh, to get some information, and unfortunately, the dean has been called away to their own meetings, and there's nobody there manning the office. You do have student assistants, but they're not necessarily responsible for answering the phone or getting in touch with them, and we just feel that uh, this, the dean's offices are so busy that a full-time uh, secretary or some kind of uh, administrative staff is necessary. Uh, the, as you probably have heard quite a few times, the classroom, um, 
class sizes are getting larger. Those uh, individuals who are blessed with a really nice large classroom are the ones who are get the increased enrollment because they actually have the physical space. So it would not be unusual for someone with a physical face space to have 32 kids in a, um, an English class. And as you know, with that many students, that many papers to write, the individualized attention, the, uh, the attention to detail, of course, gets put into the back burner because we're trying to accommodate the basic, basic needs of these students as they are approaching a 10th grade MCAS. One of the areas that we really would like to see is the Wi-Fi, and we're not just talking about the, um, the output. The Wi-Fi department or the tech department is the hub of the school system. Everything depends on them. And we just feel that more money should be uh, put into this in terms of uh, staffing and, um, and the needs that they have since they serve us all. And without them, we become a dead zone. And that actually happened on um, parent conference night where the uh, system went down and we were not able to access students' grades and their schedules for the parents. Last thing is, um, is, of course, the building itself, the usable bathrooms, et cetera. I do want to emphasize we are very, very grateful to have the uh, elevator up and running. And um, we can't say thank you enough to the custodial staff, especially at the beginning of the school year um, when people were moving around. These gentlemen and women literally carried a uh, desk. They they carried um, boxes, they carried chairs up five flights of stairs, and I, I can't give them a bigger Christmas present than saying thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. And Linda Hansen. Oh, good evening. My name is Linda Hansen. I'm the president of the Arlington Education Association. Mm -hmm. My remarks actually have to do with hopefully my final words on the Park MCAS decision, and I know it's on your agenda later. Um, uh, so I'll defer to you, uh, Mr. Schlickman, if you want me to make my comments now or later. It's Be up my to guest. You. Go, go for it now. Okay, great. So, you know, with the recent update, uh, the, the, mo the latest update about the, the fact that the long composition will now be scrapped for MCAS, that some of the park questions are going to be put on MCAS, we feel like we have, you know, kind of the last and best information that we can have um, to make a decision. So we just had a board of directors meeting um, the, earlier this, this evening. And basically this is the feeling of, I think, the majority of teachers at this point. What the decision comes down to at this point is really you're going to have a time test or an untimed test. You're going to have a test with a lot of park content or a test, the MCAS test, with some park content in it. You have hold harmless, you have not hold harmless. And I think um, really the way that teachers are looking at this at this point in time is that they would look forward to a two-year break in the accountability system. That said, they want to learn as much as they can about the park test during that time because they know full well that at the end of two years when the accountability machine gets turned back on, mm -hmm. they want to know as much as they can about the test that they, both they and their students are going to um, be accountable for. So I think, um, you know, really there's been sentiments going both way on this one, but the where, where we come down now with all the information that we have at hand is that teachers are ready to move forward with PARC. We appreciate the, the opportunity to decide online or paper and pencil at a school-based level. Um, and we definitely consider the need to, to do this test drive, the test, um, that we me message that very clearly. And I think one of our concerns is that the communication around that, if this is the way you decide to go, be very clear and consistent in all schools to all teachers mm -hmm. and to the community and to the parents. Mm -hmm. um, it can't differ from one place to the next. So um, teachers are concerned about that aspect of it. Um, so we appreciate the questions that we've heard during this debate. Um, we appreciate the conversations we've had with you both, you know, during your meetings and offline outside of your meetings. And I think you know, at this point, teachers also are ready to just know what they need to expect going mm -hmm. forward so they can start to, to plan around that. So, um, you know, I'd be happy to answer any questions later on when you talk about it. But that's, I, I did want to just update you with kind of the latest feeling of the teachers about this, this evolving situation kind of week by week as it's evolved. So thank you. Thank you very much.
Okay, that concludes public participation. We now go on to the fiscal 17 budgetary needs of elementary principals and this special education department, Dr. Bodie. Yes, I want to welcome, uh, go, please come on up. I think all, all seven elementary principals are here and, oh yes, I forgot. Mr. Hanna has been sick the last couple of days and couldn't make it this evening. Mm -hmm. um, they have a joint presentation they've been working on, and I believe that Ms. DeFrancisco is going to be the primary spokesperson, but I think everyone... I'm, uh, I'm so quiet and shy, they're trying to break me out of my Right. From, I also want to acknowledge, but we also have our whole special ed administrative department here, at which um, uh, Ms. Elmer will introduce when, when we when the special education part of the pro program of the evening comes forward. Uh, but I also want to acknowledge in the back, if you want to ask any mm -hmm. questions this evening, we have our director of mathematics, mm -hmm. uh, Matt Coleman, and director of science, uh, Larry Weathers. All right. and, and you've met everybody else. So turn it over to you. Before we begin, I would like to give everybody a chance to introduce themselves. Mm -hmm. Good evening, Mark McNamee, Principal of Bishop Elementary. Karen Hartley, Principal of the Pierce Elementary. Karen Donato, Principal of Thomas Elementary. Michael Hanna, as you know, is not able to be here with us this evening. And I am Kristen DeFrancisco. I am the Principal at Hardy. And I've been chosen to represent all seven elementary schools. Mm -hmm. um, in doing so, we wanted to thank you tonight for um, <coughs> the asks of our, in our last year's presentation mm -hmm. that you granted, an update on you on how we have used the resources that we prioritized in our budget requests last year. One was maintaining the full-time social worker position at each elementary school. Mm -hmm. And this has been something that has allowed each school principal to ensure that our students' social emotional wellness is supported. Social workers have been able to not only see students individually and in small groups, but also have been able to lead social thinking lessons in general education classrooms that help students learn ways to self-regulate and access curriculum more effectively. In addition, social workers have been able to co-treat <coughs> students with occupational therapist providers and even special educators. This holistic approach allows students to practice skills in authentic settings. Mm -hmm. And you heard the teachers actually mention that tonight about how important that social emotional wellness piece is. So we really appreciated having that this year. Last year, we highlighted the need for more relevant STEM-focused learning experiences for our students in the elementary grades. By supporting the purchase and implementation of new curriculum, you have helped us to bring FOSS, which stands for Full Option Science System, to elementary students in first, second, and third grade. New units of study are well underway, and teachers have received professional development to aid in their instruction. As a result, students are engaged and hands-on inquiry-based science opportunities aligned to next generation science standards. Children are building parachute systems to study air resistance, designing solutions to real life design problems, and developing a concrete understanding of engineering. We look forward to the next phase of implementation for our fourth and fifth graders next school year. And you actually also heard the teachers talk mm -hmm. a little bit about wanting more kits for that. By granting our request to increase teacher assistant salaries this year, we feel that we are able to maintain the teacher assistants that we have worked hard to integrate into our learning communities. Our teaching assistants are being asked to learn about all that is required to support the school cultures that we have. They work with the greatest amount of students in the building. They help to support students in all areas of the building and during all subject areas. Oftentimes, our building teacher assistants are needed to be the most flexible staff member in the building. This is truly why we feel we need to show our TAs how much we value their important work and appreciate your help to do just that. Last, we were able to keep class sizes down for most classrooms and in most schools. As stated during our asks last year, small class sizes are allowing teachers to meet the district goal of providing inquiry-based differentiated experiences for all our students. With projected enrollment growth in Arlington, we all will need to be sure to continue watching this closely and working to maintain the manageable class sizes that you helped us to finance last year. And I'm sure that, will be, that has been a theme mm -hmm. and will continue to be a theme, the, the growing enrollment mm -hmm. um, that we're certainly all concerned about. 
As we move into thinking about next year, we have still kept our district goals in mind and are requesting support based on fulfilling these goals, as well as continuing to build on the momentum we are seeing based on investments that our town has made in the elementary school programming. Our staff and community are committed to a system in which all students meet high standards. This requires continued support for our teachers in implementing rigorous standards-based curriculum and instruction, as well as our students receiving the extra supports needed when necessary to meet these standards. <clears throat> the Arlington community has come to expect this for their children as well they should. We have been very mindful at looking at data around our students with the highest need. Due to enrollment growth, this high needs group has grown. For example, for the first time, the Bishop Elementary School has been recognized with a high needs subgroup. This means the high needs group of students is large enough now to document. As we look across our accountability data, we see our most noticeable achievement gap developing with students in high needs populations and their ability to meet yearly growth targets. What we are also seeing is a direct connection between rising enrollment, which is creating a resource gap directly tied to this high needs group. Um, and we think for clarification, it's important to talk about what that high needs group means. So a high needs student belongs to at least one of the following individual subgroups. Students with disabilities, <coughs> English language learners, and former English language learner students, or economically disadvantaged students. For a school to be considered to be making progress toward narrowing proficiency gaps, the cumulative PPI for both the students, group, and high needs students must be 75 or higher. In short, in order to stay committed to the high standards to which the community and our students have become accustomed, and to support the growing high needs students due to increased enrollment growth, we're asking for financial support in the following areas. One, we ask that we are able to sustain the resources given to support last year's requests that were discussed at the opening of our presentation. Mm -hmm. Those are full-time social worker in each school building, STEM curriculum, and increased salary for teaching assistants. This will continue to help meet our goals for this year. Two, as you know, Tools of the Mind program is a rigorous, full-day, academic kindergarten curriculum replacing a curriculum that emphasized morning academic programming only. In order to implement this curriculum with integrity, a great deal of both academic and social-emotional supports are needed. This program currently operates with a part-time TA, and this is not enough support. It is important that our students' first year with us serve as a foundation in developmentally appropriate rigor, which we expect to grow vertically. Teachers are certainly not able to implement with the same rigor in the afternoon without an assistant. To this end, we are asking, again, for full-time teaching assistants in kindergarten to support the delivery of the Tools of the Mind program with integrity and high quality for all students, as it is meant to serve as a foundation for future grade levels. Third, due to increased enrollment, we find ourselves servicing a larger number of students, and we need adequate resources to support these children. Currently, we do not have the staff to address the sheer number of students being identified for support, both through special education and intervention. We know that best practices and research support a system where students experience the majority of their learning in the general education classroom. In order to see this model rise to its fruition, we need to consider the rising caseloads of our learning specialists. They are keeping up with service commitments for students on IEPs writing and maintaining all individualized plans for their students, attending all required team meetings, and attending meetings to be part of the R RTI process for all children. Learning specialists are doing all this while keeping abreast of the curriculum, and curriculum changes at up to three grade levels. This is quite a mammoth task. We would like to see our learning specialists be a more intimate team with eight or less teachers and no more than two grade levels. This would allow more common planning time, more co-teaching, more thoughtful differentiation at the beginning of each curricular unit to assist our high needs subgroup students. To this end, we are asking for four additional specialists, which would bring each elementary school up to having three, mm -hmm. with each having a TA to support in order to address the need to build teacher capacity to adequately service students with diverse high needs. Mm -hmm. As part of our support plan for teachers and students, we are exploring the beginning implementation of a coaching program in Arlington. So this is our fourth ask. 
Currently, both literacy and math coaches work with teachers to build their capacity as they educate a wide range of learners. The idea behind coaching is to help all staff members deliver, deliver a high quality curriculum that will meet the needs of all students. Coaches help to support the differentiation and delivery of instruction. They help to develop rigor and build capacity of teachers and special educators. In addition, a group of educators consisting of math coaches, literacy coaches, principals, mentor teachers, and Dr. Chesson are working to strengthen this program with the help of a distributed leadership workshop orchestrated by the Department of Education and Consultants Education Delivery Institute. This work will help us to implement this program with success and allow the program to grow. Due to enrollment growth, our ability to afford all schools this coaching model is becoming more difficult. Mm -hmm. An increase in coaching staff will make our resources commensurate across the district. And so to that end, we support the district vision for increasing coaching staff at the elementary level as outlined by Dr. Chesson. In order to involve stalled implementation and leverage our investment so far, we are looking to continue our professional development around around and acquisition of FOSS science curriculum, our fifth ask. This curriculum has started what has been a need in our elementary schools and asked for by our communities for quite some time. Next year, we need to complete the implementation in first through fifth grade. So that will complete grades one, two, and three and actually start mm -hmm. grades <coughs> four and five. To that end, we are requesting funding to continue the implementation of the updated FOSS science curriculum at all elementary schools. Our sixth ask, we also hope to start a three-year plan to overhaul the elementary mathematics curriculum. The new curriculum is aligned to the new Common Core state standards in both process and content. Our request includes funding for mathematics curriculum updates for kindergarten through grades two. This curriculum is Common Core aligned and supports differing, dif differing types of learners. And finally, seven, you will see on your budget sheet that we're asking for a variety of much needed curriculum materials. These include Lucy Calkins kits for new classrooms, LLI kits for schools that don't have them, math manipulatives, and non-fiction reading materials aligned with the Common Core state standards. In closing, the elementary school principals are looking to continue building small grade level teams of educators that include classroom teachers, special educators, and their TAs, math and liter literacy coaches, social work support, and additional support staff. With this in place, it will be our goal to build the capacity of all who work with our students so that they may provide rigorous opportunities for students in which all are able to engage and access successfully. We hope that in speaking with you today, you are able to understand how important it is to be mindful of our enrollment growth and that we feel it our responsibility to be proactive around this growth so that we can continue to give the Arlington community the high quality education they have come to expect from us as a school district. We feel that momentum around these initiatives is key and when we are able to support and keep up the momentum, or rather when we are unable to support and keep up the momentum, it derails students, teachers, and administrators. We know that with your support around these initiatives, we will be able to sustain momentum and provide a rigorous, equitable education for all types of learners. And before I thank you and open up to any questions that you might have, both, both how we are using what you were able to fund for us last year and what we're asking for this year, you know, I think it's, it's really an honor for me to be able to represent the principals. I, this is, a, I'm very passionate about what I do and, and so are, you know, the people that are sitting next to me. And I think, and what I hope that you're getting out of our speech is that you know, with this, with this enrollment growth and, you know, with our, with our vision around how we want students to, to learn in Arlington and what Arlington has come to expect from mm -hmm. us as educators and for their children, um, what we're asking for is really to maintain. We want to maintain mm -hmm. initiatives that we have, mm -hmm. you know, gathered momentum around from, you know, for teachers, for ourselves, uh, for the administration, the upper administration. Um, and in order to do that with this higher enrollment and the growth of students on a daily basis, really, we're not waiting for next year, they're mm -hmm. coming right now. Mm -hmm. um, we really wanna be able to, to continue the, this momentum around initiatives that we've started um, and give kids the very best that we can do. Um, and with that, I thank you for the opportunity to speak with you this evening and have shared our requests, not in order of priority. I think that you know we, we say that we may wanna prioritize what we get 
they're all important. Um, and one without the other is not as effective. And so we've been really mindful mm -hmm. about how we've presented to you tonight um, so that you know that without one of these things, the others don't work. Mm -hmm. um, we're happy to answer any questions you may have about these requests, as well as how we're using our resources around last year's requests. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, let's go around the room for folks who want to question or comment. Mr. Hainer. I don't have any questions for you. I do want to thank you all. Uh, you, you, we thank you. You still have a thankless job. You've got to run. <coughs> we could give you everything. We'd give it to you. Uh, and even when we don't give you everything, you do a great job. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Mr. Pierce. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to echo my colleagues' comments. Uh, I've got two young kids in the schools, elementary and middle school level, and uh, they come home every night very excited about what they're doing. We as parents are excited about them being happy and learning, and we hear that from a lot of other parents in the community and, and people who don't have kids in the schools but who remember how strong the Arlington schools have been. So thank you very much. Um, last week uh, when we were talking with the middle school and high school representatives, I'd asked a couple of quick questions to each of them. Um, if you have a number, I'd love to know it. And if you had to define your top three of your asks of, I believe, seven or eight, what would those be? Again, I think it's hard to say what the top three would be because they're very, they're very, um, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a woven fabric. You know, what we're trying to do when we say we're talking about coaches, those coaches are going to support special educators. Special educators are going to support teachers. Um, the curriculum is going to support the instruction. Um, and, it, and in addition to that, when you think about the enrollment that we're um, experiencing right now and we talk about smaller class sizes or we're adding in a teacher, that represents more than just adding in a teacher. You know, that represents how do we then make what those kids in that classroom are going to get, whether it be there, there, here, the same. And in order to do that, we need to support that teacher. We need to do that with special educators. We need to do that with math coaches. We need to do that with a rigorous curriculum. So I don't think I can give you a top three. And I'm going to look to the left and the right. I don't think they would give you a top three either. But one of the things I, and I don't know if this was purposeful from the start, but looking back over the requests and the asks in the, the conversations that we've had, what's really clear is we're talking about next steps mm -hmm. in processes and initiatives that have started. Um, in, for example, talking about tools of the mind and seeing that um, program and initiative through requires continued significant support for those kids. Um, the work that we've done with science is great, but we're really only, we're hitting some of our youngest students right now and we need to continue to grow that so that when children leave the elementary school, they're ready for the great work that's happening in Odyssey. Um, in, with uh, the, the initiatives that they've started in the sciences. Um, so, if you, I mean, when you look at the asks, what I, what I hope that you see is we're not asking really to reinvent or to start or to pilot or to, to begin. We're looking for you to support us in continuing really strong um, academic and social emotional programming that's happening at the elementary school. And they are all, inter they are all, are all interwoven in some way. When I, I think about, and when we thought about putting things in, in order, you know, yes, Kristen said, you know, we're passionate. You know, we all know we're all passionate about what we do. When I look back here at Liz Higgins here, who is a master teacher, who, you know, over the years can say, hey, I got this, you know, um, just give it to me, I'll take it. But when I have master teachers coming to the table and saying, we need more because this is happening, we listen, we listen to stuff like that. And so that priority, and again, we'll reiterate, it's all connected and what we want to do is to sustain what we have going on as a district right now. Everything that we put money into, we need to put more money into and, and build on it and make it greater so we can continue to develop and deliver the high quality education. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it means a lot that, you know, the teachers are here tonight, you know, to hear how, you know, is serendipitous. Uh, I mean, what you, your asks, the elementary asks are the same mm -hmm. as ours. And so that's really saying a lot. There's a lot of power behind that. I think the other thing that, you know, I, I'm actually thinking as you just said that, being able to be an administrator and being in all classrooms and evaluating, mm -hmm. um, 
and pay attention because I'm about to compliment the evaluation system. <laughs> um, it, is, it is a wonderful thing to be able to go in and give feedback and to watch how classrooms work and, and how you know, they make what we're talking about, this intimate group of people who really all have a role in, in, in bringing education to our kids. I want that to look the same in all 19 classrooms. And right now, I can't do that because I don't have enough people to do that. And the people that I do have are very taxed because as we increase, increase this enrollment um, and we ask them to know uh, third grade curriculum, fourth grade curriculum, fifth grade curriculum, be able to differentiate it, be able to adapt it, um, be able to make it rigorous, be able to um, address needs of different learners, that's a lot. And so I want to be able to say, I can do that in every single classroom. And I think this list that we've come and you know, put together will allow all of us to do that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Thank you. Dr. Allison Ampey. Um, so I have one question, which is that, can you give a copy of your remarks to Ms. Fitzgerald? I think she already has, has a copy, she, yes. Okay, good. Okay. That, that'd be great because I'd like to, I know I missed some things while I was writing down. Mm -hmm. And the other is more of a comment just that I just want you to know that I know I and I'm sure the other members of the committee who are involved talking to the town in terms of trying to work out the budget for next year, <coughs> we're really listening and we're, I'm writing down your words and trying so I can bring them directly to them, um, trying to get us as much money as we can to do what you're asking. Thank you. I just want to make a note that uh, Ms. Starks is ill tonight, and that's why she's not with us. Uh, last week, it, she was visibly ill, and she uh, needed the rest. So I know she really, really wanted to be here because the, the, the budget talks uh, are dear to her heart. Mr. Thielman. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I have <clears throat> three children in elementary school, so this is something I'm paying attention to. I heard that gym teacher, the uh, talk at the beginning about um, the increase in enrollment causing space and noise issues at the elementary school and the gym classes, and uh, I'm sure my children have contributed to that. In fact, <laughs> <laughs> in fact, it's actually been documented in some of the reports that have come home. So, <clears throat> so um, the, qu the question I have is: Do you have? Did you? I mean, do you have an FTE total? Do you have a full-time equivalent total that you came up with? No, mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. That's probably not a bad strategy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, get that. but do you? Mm -hmm. yeah. Is that Kathy, do you? Uh, it'll be. I'll reflect your speech, yeah. and I'll reflect mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Dr. Bodie and Ms. Johnson, who is uh, defending our capital budget right now at the Capital Planning Committee, it's cut night. So uh, we're very happy that she is where she is standing up for us right now. But uh, we'll expect to get a full outlook as to what the FTEs look like and what we require in order to run a building. Anything else? Uh, well, yeah. Well, when we get the number, we get the number. The coaches. Mm -hmm. um, how many coaches are we talking about per school? How many coaches do we currently have now? And, and, and how many do you want? Yeah. Do? Um, do you want to have Matt? Want, do you want to have yeah. Matt answer that question? That would so be great. Linda's here, too. Actually. Well, do you want to move up? Yeah. Yeah. Come on up. Come on up. And then, and Linda, do you want to talk about that for literacy? Yeah. Well, yeah, we, we've got a couple of experts here. We, come, we don't fool around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks for having us. Um, so right now for the math coaches, uh, among the seven schools, we have 5.1 FTE. They're not all full-time. Mm -hmm. So what we're attempting to do, trying to do, is work towards something that's a little bit more one-to-one. -one. Uh, right now, since some are part-time in some schools, some are split between a couple of schools um, with you know, the, the number of teachers that we're working with. Um, the fact that a lot of the teachers are really reaching out and wanting to, to work with them, uh, I just want to beef it up a little bit just to try to get to the point where I think we can service the teachers much better. So for math, it's 5.1. What's the magic number to make it work? Right now it's uh, 5.1, you want to go to? I, I think the budget ask was 1.6. 1.6 uh, more, yeah. so, six, so you're going to go to 6.7. Roughly, yes. FTEs. Math coaches at the elementary level. Mm -hmm. Yes. Got it. Thanks, Matt. Hi. So at the, for literacy coaches, we're 1.6 right now for seven schools. Ouch. <laughs> you are tough. We're, we're tough. Yeah. yeah. 
So I'll, I'll let Dr. Chesson maybe talk about what the vision is. Um, more, I mm -hmm. think, is the vision. <laughs> more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We, so. I, think, I think we asked for 1.0 additional. Um, okay. We know that that's minimal. Um, it, it should be more than that. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 does the way the coaching work, does it, are you, are you kind of coaching teachers who then can become coaches of other teachers? Um, well, for the most part, I mean, in terms of the, in terms of math, it's been evolving over the time okay. because of the fact that you know, a couple of years ago, uh, I think we really needed to pay a lot of attention to the curriculum. We yeah. need, really need to work with the teachers in terms of understanding the curriculum, uh, restructuring the units. Uh, thinking about different ways in which they can structure their classes, uh, thinking about way, different ways in which they could actually implement the lesson, uh, spending a little bit of time for the math. So the coaching for the past two years, two years prior, really revolved around that. It was a lot of the foundational stuff. And now what it's evolving into is um, we have coaches who videotape lessons, and then they sit down with teachers and they talk about uh, the characteristics, the aspects. Um, they're common planning with the teachers to kind of think about uh, you know, the types of questions that should be asked, uh, different ways in which you can actually take some of the, the content uh, and differentiate it. Mm -hmm. So you might ask the secondary question uh, that enhances it. You could ask other questions or modify some of the numbers or certain characteristics of the problem if a student is struggling. So it's, it's really about trying to mine and get a little bit more out of what I would call that initial exposure to the instruction, just so there's, uh, there's some more depth there. So that's primarily of where it's going right now. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not really meant to create a teacher who could then coach another teacher. Um, it's, a lot of that is about time. You know, these are yeah, coaches yeah. who are working with, mm -hmm. you know, multiple grades yeah. uh, across a whole entire school. It's, it still is, it doesn't sound like a whole lot, but the math coaches work their tails off in their own. They can't tell you exactly what they do, but mm -hmm. they never stop working. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, that's kind of how it is. And I would say from the literacy point of view, we started out, we were fewer um, for sure when we started out, but our role initially was really to create and, and run a response to intervention reading program. And it's really evolved mm -hmm. through the Common Core um, needing a lot more support for classroom teachers for a new way of approaching reading and writing. The whole writing workshop model, mm -hmm. the reading workshop model, the rigorous common core units of study. So the RTI reading program is really um, at kind of a good strong maintenance level right now. So we were repurposed mm -hmm. to start working with classroom teachers to really help them better make the transition to the common core curriculum. So, you know, just today I was telling um, Thad that I was in his school for about half the day uh, in a fourth and a fifth grade classroom hosting the new mentor, the first and second year teachers, um, observing an expert writing teacher. We were videotaping her. We're going to post that um, for grade level teachers to watch. We were talking about teaching and instructional practice in real time. So with 1.6 of us yeah. spread out over seven schools, it's, it's kind of thin. But it, it's really a very much a repurposed role. And the idea is that we're supporting classroom teachers now in the hard work that they mm -hmm. need to do. Yeah, that's a good point. Also, you made me think about the elementary schedules. Mm -hmm. And sometimes in a secondary school, you can coach teachers to be coaches, and then you mm -hmm. can mm -hmm. wait, make a little time in the schedule for them to gain some, some leadership experience and move right. up in leadership. And that's a way to identify future administrative talent. But the elementary schedule's got mm -hmm. a lot of restrictions. Can I say one thing in response mm -hmm. to that? I think, yeah. and develop teacher leaders mm -hmm. who can actually stay in the classroom yeah. and <laughs> have an added role, which yeah. is to mentor mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. become teacher leaders. Mm -hmm. But you know, we need those people to want to stay in the classroom yeah. as well, too, because we don't want to take all that expertise out of the classroom. Mm -hmm. No, I, I I know. Yeah, I know you didn't, but I just... But like, there's needs at both sides, you know, there yeah. needs to create so, administrative... Time. So the whole entire RTI, to kind of clarify it a little bit more, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and the budget asks were also, I think, student intervention is for math. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So it's kind of this um, shift. Right now, in math, we're heavier with the coaches, mm -hmm. but we don't have any student interventionists. Mm -hmm. In literacy, they're heavy with the interventionists, but they don't have much coaches. Mm -hmm. So the asks are more about kind of trying to find a little bit more balance with that. Mm -hmm. Oh, go ahead, yeah. Clearly, I've broken out of my shell at this point. Did, did, did anyone left? Okay. The other thing that is nice about that from the principal perspective is when we're giving feedback to teachers, mm -hmm. whether they be non-professionally status teachers or teachers that have been doing this a really long time, it's nice to be able to say, um, I see this, this is wonderful, this is great. I also see this, and it would be my expectation that this is what this would look like, but I have somebody that can help you. 
Mm -hmm. I have a coach that can come yeah. and model for you. I'd like you to work with that person. Um, and now you've built that teacher's capacity. And that's huge mm -hmm. for a principal to be able to have that and do. Mm -hmm. You know, furthermore, in talking back, you know, to what we talked about in the speech, is that being able to have that person as part of planning and looking at units and tweaking things, and not just looking at kids that need differentiation on the lower end, but also really taking a look at those kids that need differentiation on the higher end. You know, we're about engagement. We want all kids to be engaged, mm -hmm. and that means meeting them where they're at, and this helps us mm -hmm. certainly to do that. My last question is the, the, about the coaches. Does the, do the coaches, do, having the coaches allow you, give you, free you up to do some coaching as well? Does that give you time, or does that, or just, there isn't time? Did you say free me up? No, I mean, is that what you said? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're coaching, if you're working with a teacher, right. we might need some well, it, assistance it, it, maybe. You know what it does? It, it allows it to be um, a really focused, I think, mm -hmm. um, non-threatening, non yeah, because no, it's non-evaluative, yeah. but it's also consistent, because yeah. Matt's coaches, Linda's coaches, and Linda, she's one of the coaches, are giving that same message. So I think for us, it frees us up in the sense that, you know, while we are coaches, we don't have to know every little tiny detail that's going on in Matt's head because his coaches do, and I can get that from them. Um, so in some sense, yes, it, it does free me up. I mm -hmm. okay. use free loosely. Last, thank you very much. Last question, science kits. There was a conversation, somebody made a presentation about the need for science kits. Is that is that in your, in this? Larry, mm -hmm. this is here. And Larry is also here. Oh, Larry. Okay. <clears throat> So could you just kind of speak to the science kit Good. issue the teachers raised it as well at the elementary level? Didn't I hear something about science kits? Mm -hmm. yeah, about not it. having mm -hmm. enough, Larry. Boss science kits. Not having enough science oh, kits. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. Now, yeah. I um, wasn't sure what you were referring to. But yes, uh, what rolling out the new science program is uh, sort of a monumental task because of all the materials that it involves. It's not just a curriculum, it's materials management, it's kits, it's, it's replenishing those kits, it's uh, all of the text materials that goes with those kits. And it's expensive. Yeah. And, and so um, w when, when we planned this, uh, we, we decided that we would roll forward with it. We were waiting for all the next generation standards to come out, they're out and we're trying to, uh, to address those. But there are little problematic humps here and there in, in the buildings because when you have a particular grade level in a building that has four classrooms instead of the normal three in a sense, it, pr it uh, creates a lot of extra stress on the use of those materials. Mm -hmm. We're already pushing the limit of, um, and you heard some of the teachers say, we'd love to have more kits to use. Mm -hmm. And that is because to have one kit shared by four classroom teachers throughout the year, it, it just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. You know, marginally we will make it work, but to, to ideally support it, we really need to get extra kits in there to cover those mm -hmm. needs. So we, we have the, we have covered what is basic, and we need those extra kits in grades one, two, and three, which we started to implement this year, and the same problem will come up in grades four and five next year. Thank you. Yes. That, that helps. Dr. Seuss. Oh, 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 oh further comments? Yeah, yeah, in addition to the, uh, the additional mm -hmm. materials mm -hmm. and the same kits, um, providing the same amount of kits for each grade level provides mm -hmm. a more collaborative experience mm -hmm. uh, across the grade level. Mm -hmm. As we think about children having the same experiences, um, grade level teams working together, mm -hmm. collaborating, using data to inform their, their instruction. We are looking at writing across the curriculum. All this work cannot be done with this mm -hmm. one kit per grade level. Mm -hmm. So it's really it's extremely important that uh, we are able to, um, you know, again, continue to build on what we've started and, and, and grow and to supply our teachers with what they need to successfully mm -hmm. collaborate and educate the children. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Dr. Seuss. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you for coming here, and uh, thank you for your dedication and your hard work. Um, 
Uh, I just actually have a clarifica clarificatory question. Um, the first few asks seem like they were to be to maintain what we did last year. Is that is that correct? Mm -hmm. Not to increase it necessarily. Not to increase. Okay, so okay, that that was just my clarification. Just enjoyed it so much. We want to keep it going. Just like and that. yep, great, awesome. Um, so that's that's all I wanted to ask. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mr. Hanier, did you have a clarifying oh, question? I get the answer. Thank you. Okay. Um, pardon me for eating dinner. Uh, uh, Dr. Allison Ampey. I, I sort of have a clarifying question. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Bodie or Dr. Chesson, I'm looking at the FY17 budget ask that we received under the elementary school increases in the FOSS science expansion. Is that going to cover, what, what is that going to cover? Is that one kit per classroom? Is that another kit per school or, or what? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'm going to have Larry. Can you talk about what, how we came up with that number? Mm -hmm. Because I can guess, but he'll tell you. It's The narrative, okay. <clears throat> yeah. It might be helpful to also tell them what the unit cost is. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. sure. Uh, the, uh, yeah. the, the answer to your direct question, first of all, is that we were trying to, again, make this work, and in order to minimally, minimally target those places that needed extra kits, mm -hmm. it would be targeted to those schools and those grade levels mm -hmm. that had a fourth classroom. Mm -hmm. So it would be a set of three mm -hmm. kits mm -hmm. for a, a particular example, like let's say a, a third grade ed bracket. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that would be three extras, but there are about six situations around the district right now where there are four teachers in a grade level mm -hmm. in a building. So, so that's, you know, three times six is 18 more mm -hmm. kits. Each kit is approximately $1,200. Mm -hmm. And that's just for the materials. Uh, the teachers have also been asking for additional manuals. Mm -hmm. The kit comes with one manual. Now that means that the the teachers need to share those manuals. They do have access to some online manual materials, but it's not the same as as uh, walking around with it as you're planning. And and um, so so that's the you know 18 kits, mm -hmm. uh, about thirteen hundred dollars a kit mm -hmm. across the district, and that's just to get the minimal amount there of one kit for the most part for three classroom teachers to share. Mm -hmm. I just have a clarifying question. So the clarifying question, my, my clarifying question is one kit per year per grade or are there multiple No, 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 the, the design is, and, and we're, we're really trying to um, follow what the new mm -hmm. next generation standards are, the, mm -hmm. the Massachusetts iteration of that. And it, to, to address all the standards that mm -hmm. are required, we, every classroom should be using three kits. Mm -hmm. during the year. Mm -hmm. There's a life science kit, an earth science mm -hmm. kit, and a physical science kit, and mm -hmm. they should rotate through those. Now, again, even, even that, I mean, ideally, every classroom teacher would have three kits. Mm -hmm. uh, sharing three kits during the year for three teachers mm -hmm. still brings problems because it needs to be restocked mm -hmm. in between. Uh, the, you know, the planning is another issue. So, so we're trying to just make sure we can cover all the bases. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe at some point we'll have one kit for every classroom teacher. I, I think, to okay. be frank, we've done this the cheapest way possible. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. And um, I mean, and one thing that hasn't been mentioned, you know, with, with, with our attention to addressing students of high needs, mm -hmm. it, would be, it would also be important in, in the real extension of this, to have at least manuals, if not kits, available for the ELL teachers mm -hmm. and for certain SPED mm -hmm. support areas. And, and that's really what's needed to address the whole, all the needs of all of the students. Mr. Thielman. So the clarifying question, just for the people watching, how long do the kits last? How long? How long did it what? Did how it long? How long can you, how many? Oh, how yes. How often? Got yes, it? yes. The, uh, each kit is designed for uh, approximately 10 to 12 weeks. And can you reuse it the next school year? Or can 
Oh yes, yeah. and 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 there. So for the twelve hundred dollar or thirteen hundred dollar kit, there it's it's approximately it varies per kit, but it's it's somewhere under a hundred dollars to replenish it, mm -hmm. and it can last for many years. And then it can last a long time. In fact, mm -hmm. our old kits, I think. The ones that we're using before this year were there for 20-something years. That's a very good data point. Mm -hmm. But but mm -hmm. they, by this time they have disintegrated, and yeah. <laughs> so that's where we felt. Trying we to replace 20-year science kits. Yeah. In exactly. An era. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, a long lifespan. A lot, a little bit changed. The microchip yes, got smaller and smaller. Right. And, yeah, yeah. And they have provided wonderful resources for the teachers about differentiation mm -hmm. and ELL support and uh, ties to the Common Core of both math and ELA. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, and, and a robust online platform, that's correct, and, Mr. and a lot Hainer. of support. I think so. I support this 100 percent, and I, I would suggest to the committee and to the administration that this become a regular, mm -hmm. for a better phrase, line item mm -hmm. in it so that they're not coming back begging every single year. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a program that we seem to support. Uh, the added manuals and stuff, I can remember doing the, the kits mm -hmm. that we got out of MEC uh, when you had one manual. Uh, somebody would annotate it and it was not quite the annotations I would have put into it and stuff like that. It's important to have mm -hmm. and for us to invest in this and recognize this mm -hmm. uh, as a regular part that comes, comes ahead. Thank you very much. May I also okay. uh, Dr. Brody. Oh. I would also add to this as we, as we move forward, uh, just similarly to math and literacy, we really are going to need to be thinking about coaching as well, not to mention all of the professional development that's necessary uh, around the new generation science standards. Um, so in, it, when Dr. Chesson says this is minimal, it is, because mm -hmm. to some extent we're relying on the teachers to do all the reading these manuals without necessarily the kind of uh, extensive support that they, they need uh, as we move forward. So um, while we're not specifically asking for that, we have been talking about that. So I also want to say that there are things that we have talked about that we need that n didn't necessarily make this, mm -hmm. this list because we're trying to be as careful mm -hmm. and as responsible as we can in terms of what we really need. Mm -hmm. But that would, be, that would be there in terms of kind, some kind I, of support. I would 100 percent support that. I think that um, you know, the day-to-day the -day kind of support that needs to go on mm -hmm. um, really has to come from somebody that can uh, hold the hand of mm -hmm. the teachers that are not science specialists, mm -hmm. that need to run through this. The teachers can do it fine after a year or two of going through it, but in the beginning they need that support. Mm -hmm. and. Um, as a K through 12 district science coordinator, mm -hmm. it's hard to get to all the seven elementary buildings mm -hmm. to do mm -hmm. that. And, and I think that that support is really needed. Mm -hmm. so. um, a couple things. First of all, uh, the research uh, shows in, in practice uh, that we have strong principles and good coaching. You have great schools because great teachers respond in that kind of a climate and an environment. And I think one of the reasons why we have uh, such great schools in Arlington is because of the leadership of the principals and the people who are supporting teachers. Mm -hmm. um, Tom Brady has a coach. And if Tom Brady needs a coach, he has multiple coaches, uh, the best teachers want the coaches. And it's an important service. It's an important professional development tool we provide for them. And that's why I see the importance of that. Um, I'm just sort of wondering if the committee would like to actually see some, uh, see a kit and maybe get a sense of what this is all about live and in person, because talking about science kits is not half as much fun as actually seeing one. I would love it. In fact, I think some kids could come and demonstrate a few of the oh, activities. Yeah. That would be even more fun. How about coming into the schools? I love that. Be true. Happen, and then you can actually see the kids and see the professional development and the support for teachers um, with the shortage that we have right now. It's tough really for us, on, uh, many of us in, uh, who work in other school systems or in other jobs during the day to be in the school, but <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that you want to do that. <laughs> Um, 
if he, he, you, you, you know, I, I've done the principal gig, and it's, uh, you know, I, I, could, I could hang with that. We could have some fun. You, you, you're, you're the one be, uh, getting the rocks and slings and arrows thrown at you in Central. I got 23 principals who were willing to go and give me, uh, uh, t tell me what they think of what I'm doing. But, um, um, yeah, I, I think one of the things we'd like to do is, it, when, when we come into this room, even though it's not a classroom with kids, we have the cameras, we have the attention of the community, and that's one of the reasons why making a presentation here has value. Uh, I don't think you have to sell me on the notion of kits because I deal with this stuff on a regular basis, but I think the community needs to see what the ask is and why it's important. Uh, the other thing I'm going to say is that I'm very glad that we did the social workers this year. I, 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 when I did the principal thing, I couldn't live without my social worker. Um, and, you know, it, it's uh, the way we meet needs of kids. Now, the, the obvious question that we're going to be talking about for ourselves in a few minutes is MCAS in park. So do, do any of you wish to uh, uh, cast your opinions before us uh, before we go and engage in our final discussion and vote? Mm -hmm. Uh, we are going to make a decision of going to uh, to Park or staying with MCAS, and uh, you're say, uh, and if we go to Park, there's the question of paper versus uh, electronic, and uh, we've heard a lot of testimony over the past couple of meetings, and we've had a lot of discussion among ourselves, and we're asking basically anyone who is involved with this to speak up, and I'll ask our math coordinator to hop in after you guys do. And I think that'll conclude our discussion on the topic. But uh, go ahead. And, you know, it, I don't expect you all to have the same opinion. And if you have different opinions, please express them. I'm not so, shy about doing yeah. that. I, mean. I, I don't think so. <laughs> no. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm just going to start by telling you what we all did with our um, staff, we, we went and we talked with our leadership teams about, you know, what their feelings are around the MCAS First Park. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm forgetting who spoke about it. I think it might have been Linda, uh, who, who said very nicely that we really want the ability to be able to understand and take this for a test drive. Um, for the most part, I'm not going to speak for every single one of us because there may be a couple that have a little bit of a differing from their staff, but for the most part, you know, people really were pushing toward, or teachers were really pushing toward park um, written, uh, park written, and that's, that's what we got as a general consensus. Now, of course, you always have somebody that says something mm -hmm. a little bit differently, but the majority went that way, and that is a representation from all of our buildings um, you know, combined. Thad also had something he wanted to talk about that Mark just volunteered. Mark <laughs> volunteered Thad, let me be clear, mm -hmm. to talk about mm -hmm. this. I, you know, importantly, so we've spoken with our teachers as mm -hmm. well. And so, um, you know, Linda's comments and what came through the executive board, it wasn't a surprise to us and pretty much aligned with what we all heard mm -hmm. um, in our schools. It feels like MCAS is at a point where it's been compromised enough as a tool. Mm -hmm. um, that the returns, and this, the, this came right um, from the, the one, of, one of the memorandums from the state, we're at a point of diminished returns. Mm -hmm. right. MCAS at its best tells us about progress that we've made from one year to the next comparatively. Mm -hmm. our, our, the comparative nature of MCAS reduced significantly last year mm -hmm. and now will reduce itself dramatically mm -hmm when we look at it, at results in 2016, mm -hmm. beginning of 2017. So, um, you know, we've spent some significant time talking about this. We've talked about other teachers. We've thought about it. It seems to make sense if we're moving towards a hybrid tool that we get an idea of what PARC is all about comprehensively, mm -hmm. get a feel for the experience of our students, hear um, more informed um, perspectives from our teachers so that when this happens in... 2017, 18, is that when we're looking at the, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. next kind of reiteration? Mm -hmm. We've experienced kind of holistically mm -hmm. um, from student all the way up what this tool really looks like, mm -hmm. and we can do any preparation and work with the curriculum that we need to do to make sure that we continue to have mm -hmm. that high bar um, that we've come accustomed to seeing mm -hmm. from year to year. Mm -hmm. so. I'd rather have questions now than questions then, mm -hmm. I think. It's been time to respond to those and 
And Matt, you're the content expert on mathematics. If you can offer a few words of advice to us. Uh, I'll echo Mike. whatever you need to Mike. Mike. I'll just echo There's whatever chair right behind you. Yeah. Oh, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I agree with what they said. I would vote for Park. Um, uh, at this point, having a year where we could actually spend some time uh, ironing out some of the issues, thinking about what might be some of the soft spots in our administration, in wireless networks, all those other little things that come along with it, um, yeah, I, I don't see... I, MCAS has run its course. I, I, when I look at that data, I don't know if I'm really learning anything else that I haven't learned from year to year. Uh, I think it is time to move on to something else. Thank you very much. Uh, anything else from the committee, Mr. Thielman? Um, the you know the, the school committee votes Park or MCAS, mm -hmm. and that's it. And then the district, the superintendent, with the consul consulting with you, decides whether it should be uh, administered on paper mm -hmm. or electronically. So it's not our decision about how it's administered. But I'm I would just like to get a sense of you know the, the conversation taking place in your schools about Park about paper versus mm -hmm. electronic. Just to my notification. I think there's a couple of things that we think about. We think about um, the technology piece, mm -hmm. and I'm going to tell you what a teacher would say. A teacher would say they were uh, they were probably a little bit worried about the wireless. We've had some issues this year. You had okay. somebody you hear people talk about that now. So I think that you know teachers are worried about that if they're being honest, and that's what they say. You know, it's the wireless piece. Um, they've never done it. Mm -hmm. Simple. Uh, you know, it's unknown. It's it's different. The kids have never done it. So being able to coach for them and model for them how this works, I just think it's unknown. And, you know, that will then become our job to make it feel more comfortable. Um, and it will become our job to make sure that the wireless and the technology is in place and that we have enough, you know, iPads up and running and going when we need to do that. Do I have faith that we will do that? Absolutely. Is a year of written going to make everyone feel better and then we move into a pot and into the maybe so and that might be decide how we decide what you know what we do but I think it's just that I think they're a little bit afraid of the unknown right now and I get that mm -hmm. um, you know it's a big shift for them and for the kids. Mr. Hainer? I would ask both sides uh, to do a during the non uh, state time to try the electronic at least in a small portion in every single one of the schools mm -hmm. uh, as opposed oh, to have a we, we, we can't, we can't split it I don't yeah, think. Then I, I guess then if you can't, then my concern, and I can wait till later if you want to wait in the debate. My concern is that you're trying the test, you're finding it out right now. That's the test part of it. If we have issues with the technology, we need to test it some way. We can test it at a school or a number no, no, of schools. No, no, what I'm saying is that we should be testing the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. If we can't do it with the test, but we have something oh, sure. on a regular yeah. basis so Absolutely. that we're not finding out it's going to crash yep. during the test that, yep. that counts. I hear what you're saying. So, thank you. Uh, yeah, hour of code. If schools are doing that right now, they get a pretty good sense of how many kids can be on there at one time. You might need to explain yeah. what that is, Matt. Oh, so our code is um, there's an organization called Code.org, mm -hmm. uh, which nationally pushes this effort of kids doing an hour of code, uh, of looking at coding. Uh, it's been great so far in the middle school and high school how much our computer programming uh, offerings have grown, uh, and we really just see a huge push. And I know a lot of these guys are, are using it and pushing it and doing different aspects of that program in the school, which is awesome to see. Um, one well, thing that sounds like something else we'd like to see around here. Seriously, it would be yeah, great. Come on down. Um, one thing, I don't know if you guys could push back against this, but I'm not quite sure why the state wouldn't offer grades three and four written and then grade five. They do it based on school, is that right? They do. School by school. It would be awesome if it was based on grade. You know, I, I think a, a third grade student, it's difficult to expect that they'll do well on a computer base, but I'd love to see a fifth grader do it. Um, so I don't know if that's even feedback that can be given back to someone else, or who do I call? Um, <laughs> uh, Mitchell Chester. Yeah, Dr. Singh. Yeah, he listens to us about as much as a little, yeah. yeah. 
Dr. Seuss and uh, Dr. Allison Ampey. I, I have something okay. on a different okay. issue. Okay, so Do, Dr. Allison Ampey. I'm, actually, I'm going back to the science kits and Go stuff. back to the science kits. Some of us would like to come see them in the classroom yeah. if that could be arranged. Absolutely. Not, I, I, think it's, I think there's still a lot of utility, as Paul said, to have it here, but uh, there mm. would be mm. interest. So. Okay, Dr. Seuss. Uh, so I have a, a question about a different issue for Ms. Donato about Thompson. <laughs> As you well know, in about a year and a half, you'll be about 100 kids over capacity. Um, and that's projected to go on for quite some time. You know, so it's going to be four, 480 potentially and then up to 500 for a few years, maybe down to 480, but no significant decrease. Um, one of the proposals is to take, to create some more classrooms and take one of those classrooms as an auxiliary gym space. And I was just wondering what you think um, does that satisfy the stress on the common areas sufficiently, or is there something else we need? Um, I'm, and I'm hoarse, so I apologize. Yeah. Um, we've we had we've had lots of discussions about it in small groups. We've had we had a big discussion about it last night. Um, I know that there's multiple options out there, but the best is to get the number of classrooms that are needed and to somehow create that additional flexible space. Mm -hmm. I don't know that a classroom is exactly what we're looking for, but it definitely alleviates some, it could alleviate some scheduling issues, it mm -hmm. could alleviate space with regards to enrichment and breakout and kind of mm -hmm. those types of activities. Um, it would not alleviate the double gym issue, it would not alleviate the cafeteria that we can have. So it wouldn't with an over. extra classroom as a gym space, it wouldn't eliminate d double gyms? I don't know that the classroom... It wouldn't be big enough. Would, right. Got it. You, you, we'd still be limited in what we could do. We could certainly schedule a gym class in there, but it still would be very different than what would be happening in, sure. within the gym. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. okay. Do you have a proposal? Excuse me? <laughs> do you have a proposal? We do. Okay. Do you want to... <laughs> <laughs> well, is no. there a consensus, actually, was what I was curious about, because right. I've heard lots of different ideas. Right. Uh, you know, ideally, it would be nice to have the two portables for next year and initially begin some type of construction, whether it's the permanent modulars or the permanent um, addition. The permanent addition, to me, makes the most sense because it will outlast me and probably many of us there. Um, well, they last for longer than 20 years. That's what it's like. <laughs> I'm not saying anything. Right. Um, and, you know, right, we do need an additional s flexible space. We put 430 students in the gym, um, and the maximum occupancy is technically 300, mm -hmm. um, so that's concerning. Mm -hmm. fire, by fire code, right, by fire code. And I'm sure that happens at it's adults. They know, I've already <laughs> called them, they know, no, they no. know that. I've called to, it's adults. to ask, it's right, yeah. to ask ah. for clarification. Is it 300 bodies, is it 300 chairs, is it 300 adults? So, um, but, we've, and putting 500 in there will be interesting as well. Mm -hmm. But it's, no. You're, I, you're not going to no, put 500 in there. Yeah, I'm sorry. But I, I apologize. So for an example, last night, uh, one of the gentlemen came up with an idea of if we added another exit, you know, if we created another door on the other end of the gym, does that alleviate some of the constriction around the ability to use it with so many students in there? Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's definitely mm -hmm. yeah. lots of concerns and questions around the safety piece mm -hmm. and, the, and then what we can actually do in that space. Okay, we're, yeah, that's obviously an agenda item a little further yep. down the line. Thank okay. You. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. You. Uh, you, you, you. Thank you for your service to our everything. Um, now, <laughs> yeah, uh, Dr. Allison Ampey. Did you want me to do this? Oh, yeah, Dr. Al oh, hold now? on. We've got uh, Dr. Allison Ampey would like to make a motion. Yeah. Um, okay, so I move. This, to give some framework around this, um, our budget process has begun. We're still, we haven't voted on it as a committee. We haven't even discussed it as a committee. We're just hearing it. But at the same time, the town's budgeting process is like several steps ahead. And we're starting to, or they, or however you want to compose it, are starting to talk how much money is the schools going to need? How much are we going to get? And toward that end, I am making a motion um, that this full school committee direct the superintendent to put forward to the town manager and the long range plan committee a number that communicates the full scope of the Arlington public school needs. This is envisioned as the full asks minus any anticipated revenue. She may also submit a lower number um, 
I'm saying that asks pared down and or new proposals for enrollment growth factor if she so desires. All communications should include the message that the school committee has not yet discussed nor voted on the budget proposal. Second. Uh, discussion um, on the motion, Mr. Pierce. Um, I, I read that today um, and I thought about it a lot and uh, I, have to, I have to say I'm, I'm fully on board. I think it's a great idea and um, I think it would give uh, the other side of Mass Ave an idea of what we're looking at mm -hmm. more specifically. So thank you. Uh, Dr. Can Seuss. Oh, so just to give everyone a, a clarify, like an idea of what's going on right now, um, our budget number is not determined by our need, by the children's need, by the <laughs> principal's needs. It's determined by a bunch of formulas. Uh, so our general education expenses used to be able to go up no more than three and a half percent. They're decreasing it mm -hmm. to three and a quarter this year. They are deciding to decrease it to 3% next year. Mm -hmm. uh, special ed can go up no more than 7%. And for each additional child, um, we, we get 25% of the per pupil expenses, which is insufficient. Mm -hmm. It's the marginal cost of educating an additional kid is not 100%, but it's definitely not 25%. Mm -hmm. And that number was just completely made up. It wasn't based on how much it really cost. Mm -hmm. It was based on what the financial people in town felt they could live with in mm -hmm. long-range planning. Mm -hmm. So what that means is with the enrollment increases, with the Common Core, mm -hmm. we are increasingly constrained. Mm -hmm. um, and each year it seems to be getting worse. Mm -hmm. And so I think this is a proposal, it's a good proposal to push back a little and say to the town, um, that number on paper, I understand why you're giving it to us, but it doesn't reflect our real need in our district. Mm -hmm. And so, so thank you, Chrissy. Mr. Hainer. This may be the teacher in me, but, and I've said it before, I believe strongly that my position as a school committee member is someone to advocate for education, mm -hmm. for responsible money for educa education, and not to be worried about budgets beyond where we are. Mm -hmm. The town will then turn around and accept us and fund us, or reject it and fund a lower number. At that time, we have to then mm -hmm. take cuts. But I personally believe supporting the budget that is fiscally responsible to maintain the programs and go forward with the new programs that are constantly happening in education. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Allison Ampey? Um, I'm just, I didn't mention, so I'm putting this forward because I think we traditionally have not, we've communicated needs, but not in terms of real numbers. You know, we need this much. And I'm just trying to push us to do that. Uh, Mr. Thielman. So I very much support this. this I don't think we've ever done this before. So no. our, usual, our usual vote is um, to accept the number in the long range plan, mm -hmm. whatever that is. Um, so this is a good change initiated by Kiersey and mm -hmm. the subcommittee and Kathy. And so um, good job and I'll no. be voting. This is yes. just me. We haven't. I know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, we didn't have a chance. It, it wasn't support. because the yeah. subcommittee didn't want to do it. It was I couldn't do yeah. subcommittee in the time frame. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's just, yeah. I just yeah, don't want to miss. Mm -hmm. well, you can deserve a lot of credit, so, so just take it. <laughs> <laughs> why, why put the show on here? So, okay. So I'm very much in favor of this, and I think it's a bold move, and it's about time. If you want to see a budget genius, watch her on yeah, well, really, cable yeah, TV. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we did, we did a show on Acme. Yeah, yeah. It's now online. <laughs> uh, look, uh, back in the day, when, when did we run the last override? 08? Was it? No, 11. 11. 11. Yeah. 11. Time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> um, in 2011, we did the override, which was uh, another five-year plan. And three year, the three-year three year plan, plan, rather. Right. Three, three. Three-year plan, and... Boy, he, you know, so long <laughs> And this ago. is fiscal year five. <laughs> and this is, we're five years out on the three-year plan. Right. We have uh, and one of the things we, we committed to with the town was that we wouldn't go asking for any more overrides or any other additional funding over the three years of the plan. And the design of this was to put money away in the beginning to have it toward, at the end of the cycle in order to maintain the level of services we're providing. Now, back in 2011, we weren't looking at a, a, such a radical increase in enrollment. We now are. The circumstances have changed. The promise we made to the voters of Arlington 
in, in, in this override package is we, if you pay for more, we, uh, we will maintain this level of services. Well, the town isn't adding new streets. Uh, we don't have additional uh, square footage. We don't have 10 new parks. Uh, uh, but we do have, uh, what, about 10% more kids than we did at that time. And we need to adjust the formula in order to come up with a number that doesn't allow us to go and expand programs and spend money wildly. It, we need to go and state what the principal said last week and what you guys said this week, this is because of the additional enrollment. We need to meet the needs of the additional students who are coming through the door and the additional teachers we need to uh, teach them and the ad additional support staff we need to back up everyone who's working for the students. So that's what this motion is about and I'm very pleased that Dr. Allison Ampey put it forward and, uh, and, and I'm glad this is going to become our position if it's adopted. Any other debate on the, on the motion before us? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That is a unanimous vote. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <coughs> uh, special education. Uh, our director of special education, Allison Elmer, and she has a lot of her staff here tonight. Hopefully will come up and introduce themselves. And, and while they're doing that, I, I do want to um, echo what the elementary principals have mm. said, that these asks are not mm. to be adding anything. This is really to maintain where we are. And if we don't have additional funds, we mm. are we are going to be below the service level that we have mm. we've had and, and certainly the service level that this community wants and expects. Well, certainly we're below this on class size already. We are. Mm. We are. Mm -hmm. So anyway, it's a, it's a great group of administrators, and I, um, I think that you could see that mm -hmm. this evening. Mm -hmm. So anyway, welcome. Mm -hmm. Th thank, thank you. you. We were worried you forgot about us for a second. <laughs> we didn't forget um, about we, we couldn't possibly. I was going to say, we, always, <laughs> we have quite the act. Um, I'll just start with introductions. Um, I don't think you got to meet everybody at the beginning of the year when we introduced new staff because we didn't have our full complement then. So you want to? Oh, sure. Joyce um, Verschlinger, the Early Childhood Coordinator. Hi, I'm Chris Carlson, elementary coordinator. Hi, Jill Parkin, elementary coordinator. Hello, Lynn Bennett, uh, high school coordinator. Hi, Martha Wall, the middle school coordinator. So good evening, and thank you for allowing us this opportunity. Um, we're going to use this time briefly to highlight our priorities for the upcoming school year and answer any questions you may have about these identified areas of need. Um, what you'll see is that most of our requests are reflected in the previous request, so mm -hmm. we won't go mm -hmm. too in depth since you've heard a lot from the other um, levels. We'd also like to begin by thanking you for your support of our request in the FY16 budget, which included maintenance of the full-time social workers at each elementary school, the three district-wide board-certified behavior analysts, and the accompanying behavioral support personnel, as well as the addition of the 0.5 um, FT school psychologist at Audison. Uh, I also want to just highlight the creative and fiscally responsible ways in which we have been able to strengthen the depth and quality of our special ed programming over the last year. Through the reallocation of resources, we were able to fund a full-time teacher of the visually impaired and orientation and mobility specialist. This was something, a service that we had previously contracted, um, and we were able to now bring that in district, as well as add a full-time speech and language pathology assistant in place of a 0.5 speech and language pathologist, all of this um, to keep spending neutral but allow us to meet our compliance and um, requirements. As you've heard repeatedly from both the school department and Dr. McGibbon's report, our enrollment is increasing and with this we have seen an increase in our high needs students. To reiterate, that high needs subgroup is not just special education students, it's English language learners, former formerly lim lim limited English language learners, as well as economically disadvantaged students. Um, but we know within our department that our special education population is growing. Um, I believe you have in front of you um, a, just a chart that demonstrates that unfortunately we don't have it for the viewers at home, but you can see that we gave you both October and June numbers as students get identified throughout the year, that number grows throughout the year. So if you, you can see both in September as well as 
in or in October as well as June that our numbers have gone up um, from June 2013 where we had 856 to last June where we had 934. Mm -hmm. So the increase is felt within special ed as well. Mm -hmm. um, in order to keep up with the increasing needs of this subgroup and what we are required to provide under state and federal law, we are requesting a 4.0 FTE increase to the elementary learning specialist. You heard this reflected um, from mm -hmm. the elementary principals as well so that we could distribute four learning, uh, three learning specialists at each building across the district. We know that looking at learning specialist caseloads and service delivery grids does not give a complete picture of the entirety of their roles. Um, from a purely compliance standard, um, we've provided their caseload as well as just the hours of service that they're required to provide to students through their individual education plans. And you can also see contractually what they have the time to provide. Um, and it far exceeds what we currently have for staffing. Um, but this doesn't include the meetings, the report writing, the assessment time that they have to put in, as well as the work that the elementary principals talked about um, in creating these cohesive teams, grade level teams, where a learning specialist is working with you know, two grades, eight teachers, a coach, an English language, um, learner, um, teacher, so that we're not going to fifth grade for half the day and third grade for half the day and second grade and first grade and trying to be content specialists in all those areas. Mm -hmm. um, so we would like to see this 4.0 increase at that level. Mm -hmm. We are also making a request for an additional 1.0 FT school social worker at the Brackett Elementary School. Uh, several years ago, when our in-district programs were developed, we created K-12 specialized learning centers, what we call the SLCs, mm -hmm. for students identified with autism spectrum disorders, intellectual disabilities, and emotional impairments. At the time, tough decisions needed to be made about staffing as limited resources were available to service these high-needs populations. We were able to provide full-time licensed clinical social workers to the program servicing students with autism and emotional impairments, but not for the program with students um, with intellectual disabilities. It's now time to provide similar resources to that program. Um, currently, at the bracket, they have a 1.0 FTE social worker who services all students in general education, um, kids who receive learning center supports or inclusion students, as well as the sub-separate program. Um, and again, we provided a just a chart to show you that distribution as compared to the other elementary schools that have um, these specialized learning centers. And you'll see that the caseload at Brackett far exceeds um, what the caseload is at the other schools where they have a 2.0 allocation. Another area in which we're seeing an increase in enrollment is our preschool population. The Monotony Preschool Services Special Education students entitled to services under the IDA as well as tuition paying general education students. Um, and you can see from starting in 2011 um, up to our um, most recent school year that the number at the beginning of the year and the number at the end of the year, you can see the growth um, because students become eligible as they turn three. So what we start out with in September isn't what we have at the end of the year. Um, and while the numbers have been lower in September, you can see that the growth across the year is steadily increasing so that um, by this June, mm -hmm. we'll have anticipated 17 more students, mm -hmm. um, which is, again, exceeds what we have seen in the past. And this is based off just what we know from early intervention referrals, not community students who may be turning three and parents may make their own referral. Um, to address the demand on both space and staffing, we have made a capital request to renovate the existing office space into classroom space, and we are requesting in the operating budget a 0.5 FTE teacher increase and a 2.0 um, FTE increase in teaching assistance. At the high school level, you heard Dr. Janger talk about um, several of the requests, so I'll just highlight the different requests that we have. Um, we are requesting an increase to our speech and language pathologist allocation from the current 0.5 FTE to a 1.0 FTE to meet our state and federal compliance requirements. We are also making a similar request to increase our occupational therapy therapist allocation by a 0.5 FTE for district-wide services. And um, many of you are familiar with our Millbrook program at the high school. Um, Dr. Janger spoke about this last week, but we are requesting a 0.6 FTE increase um, for special education staffing so that we can provide content area specialists to some of our most vulnerable and at-risk general education and special education students in the program. 
Um, finally, you have heard over the years the repeated request to fund higher teacher assistant salaries. We are specifically requesting that supported learning center TAs be increased to the BSP level of pay. These individuals work with our highest needs populations and are increasingly difficult to recruit, hire, and retain. With each turnover of staff, we not only invest financial resources, but teacher and specialist time and training staff for these specialized positions. You will also see that the middle school made a similar request to promote all of their TAs to BSP level salaries, which would be commensurate with the current high school practice. Hope we were brief enough. I know we got a little off schedule. So again, we thank you for your time and consideration, and we'd like to provide you an opportunity to ask us questions. We'll go around the room. Um, Not at this time. Just briefly, Mr. Chair, and Mr. Thank, Pierce. You, thank you very much mm -hmm. for the services you're providing Arlington students every day. Really appreciate it. Um, the, it didn't get into the FY17 budget ask uh, list, but I was wondering the number of FTs total and, sure. and the number. I have it ready. Okay. Um, so it's 17 total FTEs, but that reflects the requests that you heard from the elementary mm -hmm. schools, the middle school, and the high school, Got it. in addition to those 0.5 speech and language, 0.5 OT. So that reflects the entire district's request. Okay. And the total request um, that uh, Ms. Johnson provided you, it's $938,792. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey. Um, a couple questions. First, if we change the TAs to the BSP salary level, are you talking about changing their title or just the salary? Um, I would have to defer to Dr. Bodie and Mr. Spiegel on whether that has to be impact bargained or how that would no. be addressed. No, no it, does, it doesn't have to be. And uh, it's when we talk about BSP, that it's also rep represents a salary level um, more than it is necessarily the, the criteria for the, the qualifications of the candidate. But I think that in general, if, if um, a teaching assistant is supporting one of our SLC programs, I think that they would definitely certainly qualify in that category. Okay, so they don't need additional training or certification or anything? I'm well, just trying to understand. Mm -hmm. There are, well, actually, Ms. Elmer can talk about, there is, there is a certificate for um, being a BSP. Mm -hmm. We're not saying that, that, that they are that, they're at that salary level, which is different. Mm -hmm. right. We just call it the BSP because it, it signifies to us a certain salary, which is, I, I believe now, about $5,000 more. Um, it's actually closer to about six. Six, getting six closer or seven thousand dollars yeah. more. So we, it would be um, the total request for that um, change. And I have uh, you have it there. I have Miss Johnson's numbers. Um, would be it's seven thousand nine hundred twenty dollars per person. So that is one hundred thirty four thousand dollars seven hundred seventy six. Oh, okay, so the salary level. The mm -hmm. document that we see it says SLC TAs converted to BSP. Really, what you mean is just we're raising their salaries. Mm -hmm. We're not converting them to. We're BSP. not necessarily right. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, that was confusing to me. Um, and then I had a question about the preschool. Um, when you add student special education students, don't you also have to add regular ed students? Yeah, so, so our general ed classrooms, though, are capped, so they start at the beginning of the year full. So we have a 15 um, students in the classroom, eight special ed students, seven general ed students, as well as our sub-separate program, which mm -hmm. is only special ed students. Um, so we begin the year at, what, 35 general ed students, so they remain flat throughout the year. Okay. We have a waiting list, actually, My, for the general right. ed. But my question is, if we're adding 17 students this year, how are you possibly getting by with just half a new teacher and two TAs? I mean, it seem, seems to me if we're adding, you know, you're expanding So a bunch. throughout this year, we're going to be adding those students, and we're going to, um, the state allows us, if we exceed that um, ratio in the classroom, mm -hmm. that we will have to add TA support to um, do that. So currently, we will distribute them into the existing classrooms, but ideally, as we've heard, class size and when we think about our youngest learners and not only the physical needs that they have around, you know, 
toileting and hygiene, right. but in addition right. to the academic work that they're doing. And I do want to remind folks that the Common Core actually extends to the preschool, which is something we don't often talk about. So they are engaging in you know, rigorous academic work as well. You heard a little bit about their science kits and whatnot. But um, so we're similarly, we're making do um, the best we can. Um, and we also need the conversion of the space that we talked about in the capital mm -hmm. request to do this as well. OK. OK, thank you. Mr. Thielman. Uh, so I guess I just want to make sure, sure I'm clear on the numbers. Maybe, maybe s s Diane's not here. But in the memo that I read, we were talking about a $4.6 million request. Is that? And then, in the and then in the spreadsheet, I'm looking at a total of 3.88? 3.8, I believe, is the number. So the 4.6 in the narrative. Okay, it's well. It's the total asks, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, there's, then I just need to do more studying. Because mm -hmm. I see a narrative that's the first paragraph of the narrative. The, the, the cover sheet talks about 4.6. That's on, this is on Novus. Mm -hmm. So maybe there's a draft. She, Ms. Johnson will be here okay. after Capitol. Okay. All right. And then, so, so special education increases about a quarter of the total. About, about roughly speaking. Total. Okay. And what percentage of our budget is it represent, I'm wondering? Of our budget presently? Yeah. Our budget, it's probably about 30%, maybe 31%. Okay. All right, mm -hmm. good. So the increase is not as it's much It's within as the 7% that yeah. is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's within the 7%. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, <clears throat> The, you know, the one thing I'm, I'm just trying to get straight in my head is that a few years ago we were under the impression that adding TAs wasn't the best strategy for special education, and so now your strategy is they're necessary. We want to be able to retain higher quality TAs. Mm -hmm. That request is so that we have, ve we have a very difficult time, um, Mr. Spiegel, and particularly Ms. Parkin and Mr. Carlson, uh -huh. can speak to the work that we do to recruit, hire, and retain um, TAs at our current pay level. We so often pay, yeah. do that okay. work in May and June only to have somebody accept a job in August <laughs> um, because it's at a higher pay. Yeah. And we're still actually um, trying to fill a vacancy at this point. So it's a challenge. Um, there's turnover. There was turnover. It wasn't been empty this whole year. But And how many TAs do we have in the special education program right now? Total TAs. I knew you were going to ask that. Yeah. So um, <laughs> um, I have it um, here. The total TAs. So we have 19 special education TAs across the seven elementary schools. Um, we have nine one-to-one -one TAs, which are for individual students as reflected in their individual education plan. Mm -hmm. And then the SLCs, the special learning centers have um, 13 among the three and then there is a BSP that behavior support personnel and there's seven of those and given the challenges in finding TAs it, it doesn't make more sense to have uh, greater to take some of those TAs and make them into FTEs to full-time at uh, full-time positions rather so part of our request to meet the if you look at the, and we didn't really go through it. If you look at just the service requirements for the IEPs, yeah. our modest request of 4.0 learning specialist will still not tackle that. Um, so we have to rely on um, TAs to meet the service requirements. Um, if we were to cover it with just teachers, um, our ask would be substantially more. <laughs> In, okay, but you, so my, my question is, it wouldn't make sense. It doesn't. Your recommendation is let's not have more learning specialists. Let's add more TAs because that's more bodies. No, 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 we're asking to add learning specialists. We're asking. We're not asking to increase the TAs only with the additional oh. learning specialists because they're paired with a TA. We're asking to increase the salaries of the existing TAs. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sorry if that wasn't No, it in was me. In the special programs. Mm -hmm. In, the, in yes. the, um, specialized learning centers. The middle school has asked to increase the salaries at all mm -hmm. levels for the TAs. Thank you. That clarifies. Dr. Seuss. 
Um, yeah, I just have a question about the increasing numbers, um, and I could do the math mm -hmm. too, but is, it, is the proportion remaining about the same and increase uh, basically driven by our, our population increase? It is. So we stay around 14 percent, which is below the state level. I think we do our reading program and the work that we've done in our math intervention through the RTI program really does, you know, help us to stay at that level as well as that's the work that we want our special educators to be able to do when they're not just covering right. service delivery, that they're actually working with those grade level teams, pushing mm -hmm. into classrooms. And if you see the breakdown, you will see the majority of their time is actually spent what we call push in or in the classroom. Um, okay, great. I just want to extend a compliment to you all, of it, but particularly to the Monotomy Preschool. I have a uh, colleague who is a preschool parent and I hear nothing but wonderful things about what's mm -hmm. going on down there and um, thank you for your service any other questions from the committee none hearing none thank you for coming in tonight thank you thank, thank you, you. Thank you very much. Oh, there's more. Oh. Uh, dr. Allison can I answer mr. Thielman's question about oh, the go ahead. yes, yes. Um, so I think if I'm understanding the 4.6 mm -hmm. is not the ask the ask is several pages down and is um, it's on page five of six. Yeah, 3.88. And it's a 3.88 minus 400, so it's actually 3.39. And then the 4.6 number? 4.6 number is trying to back up what the growth enrollment oh, wait, wait. number should mm -hmm. be. Mm -hmm. it's, it's doing some calculations. Okay, thank but, you. But there is, a, there is a discrepancy in the total ask and then sort of what we've pared down a little bit because we're trying to be so fiscally careful, right? There's a couple of different numbers that have been thrown around. That's not that. There's that's not that's not this issue. The 3.8 so. is the is it pared down. Uh, no, it's not pared no, down. That's not the, pared that's down. The full. That is oh, that's the, the full. Oh, I that's thought the full, full was bigger. Okay, got it. No, I, I, I'm, okay. I'm sorry because I'm okay. sure I misread it. Yeah, okay. okay. I, I mean, I got to read okay. it more carefully. I think they're not labeled completely. Anyway. Okay. Okay. Um. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next. <laughs> <laughs> I'm as happy as I'm going to get. Yeah. <laughs> I'm around this. I need more time to go through. I'm Process. just. It's hard to keep up with Dr. Allison Ampey. Let's just incredibly call it what it is. I just incredibly brilliant. <laughs> Watch her on TV. Right. You'll see yeah. that. So. Um, it's time for the vote. We've discussed this a bunch. Can I ask you what, what I am? Yeah, Mr. Thielman. Yeah. On um, Park. I'm gonna, or we, oh, the, yeah. We're going to the Park versus MCAS discussion. So this is what we're going to do because we've had a lot of testimony and uh, we will, I will ask for a motion. Uh, I, I will ask for this motion for the purposes of opening debate and then we'll see whether it's approved or not. So I, I'd like to ask for a motion to direct the superintendent. Uh, to notify Desi of our decision to choose Park for 2016. That'll be the motion by Mr. So Thielman, moved. Second, second by it. Mr. Hainer. Okay, we're in business, Mr. Hainer. Hearing tonight um, from the Teachers uh, Association, Father Teachers and the Principals, I'm finding myself uh, in a slight quandary. I do not trust the Commissioner of Education uh, I accept the fact, and I think it's important for us to uh, practice uh, when it doesn't hurt us in any way. I think that's a, a very good rationale for doing it. I just, it is my sincere hope that the final test that comes out is exactly what we're testing. Um, this, uh, I've read as much as I could. Um, I still think it's a con. I think this MCAS 2.0 is nothing but park. Um, and I would like, I, mean, I don't want to speak for Ms. Starks, but I support exactly what she said the last time uh, and each time, that it's another burden on the teachers. Uh, if I could vote to not have testing throughout the state for, for two years and give everybody a break, any kind of testing, I'd do that. And I think the teachers would support that as well. Um, I would like to hear the rest of anybody else. I'm, I'm less against us doing it than I was before. I haven't 100% decided. Uh, Mr. Pierce. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think that my decision tonight will largely be based on what I heard tonight. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the further information given to our educators mm -hmm. and the people in our buildings 
uh, matter so much to me. Mm -hmm. um, I would like the committee at some point in the near future to consider uh, signing on to the proposed legislation at the State House on uh, opting out. Um, I think it would serve a valuable message to uh, the state leaders about how we feel um, this decision making process has been put to us. Um, it sort of puts us in a weird box of choosing between two apparently not perfect choices. Um, but uh, I think that uh, the decision to uh, go to park in 16 um, would serve a little bit of a break for our teachers to get used to something that could be new and uh, unbecoming to what they do. Mm -hmm. um, we know for a fact that our students excel well beyond what their uh, feelings are in, on, a, on a given day on a standardized test. We know that. Uh, because our teachers see them every day and they see their progress every day. Um, so I would very much like the committee to consider uh, the legislation, maybe on its future agenda item, for us to discuss it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Dr. Allison Ampey. Um, I'm going to make a statement. I haven't talked that much before during these discussions, mm -hmm. so it's lengthy. Sorry. Um, I'll be voting for Arlington to go with Park. Um, Last year, I voted for MCAS. I had three major concerns. First, that our technology was inadequate for electronic testing, that we at local and state levels had inadequate say in the test, that the test is timed, that it was unclear what, the what test the future would hold. I had also hoped that the additional months could be used so that any testing change would not be a hurried and harried event. I think the vote to stay with MCAS last year had political power. There had been numerous, there have been numerous changes to PARC since the PARC versus MCAS discussion began. M Massachusetts has opted to go create their own test, most likely a version of PARC. Actual test questions are now released for review. The amount of prescribed testing has dropped. However, I do not see that voting to stay with MCAS this year has the same political power. Another reason to stay with MCAS for 2015-16 was the continuity of useful data that helps our schools. Going forward, given the changes in test composition and in testing population composition, I don't think the comparison data that we'll be, we will be getting for MCAS will be as solid or as useful. Park will also have issues, but there'll be a greater pool for comparison. Um, we've heard from our teachers themselves and the principals that the majority prefer Park. This was not the case last year. We also just heard how a majority of our, how our schools all favor Park this year. Over the past few weeks, I've been asked, but why give a test? So when I say I think we should do it, I think we should do PARC this year with the clear statement that we are testing the test, we're not going to worry about the results, and we're not going to discipline anyone in results. But I've been asked, so why give a test that you're not going to count? I think this question doesn't capture my intent. I want us to give a new test in the least stressful manner co possible. By saying it doesn't count, I don't mean that we'll take the results and just throw them under a desk and ignore them. My hope and expectation will be that results will be looked at. We will work towards needed improvements, whether in testing equipment, testing prep changes in curriculum, or pushing the state to improve the test. But it'll be an environment where our staff knows their jobs are not on the line depending on test results, not, not that they've necessarily been in the past. I still have concerns about the park test, specifically its time nature, developmental appropriateness, the amount of testing, and more. I understand that park's proponents see many advantages to it, including better alignment with Common Core, more rigorous questions. Um, when I look at the options I am told we face in the near future, I see park in both of them. I think in the long run, it will be more stressful for our students if we stick with MCAS now, and then it will have to change, and then have to change over to an electronic park-like test with little or no time in a hold harmless position from the state. What I'm concerned is what has not happened in this discussion is any discussion with parents and students. One of the additional reasons I voted no last year was to buy the administration some additional time to allow better discussions with parents. I am frustrated and disappointed that this has not happened, but I'm not going to vote no, vote no just because of this. The park communication plan calls for a variety of notifications being sent to parents. I assume we'll, we'll receive an updated list of when these notifications will be sent since states have already passed and I haven't seen any notices yet. 
but the most important point is not yet included in the communication plan, that is, what type of message will be conveyed. I think it is vitally important that the administration have a clear message that we are doing a test of the test this year and that the results of the test do not matter. Finally, as I vote less, yes, I want to emphasize the two things I feel are important, most important. One, we need a robust test of our ability to conduct a, t electronic, a test electronically. By this, I feel we need to simultaneously test electronically the minimum number of schools that we would have to do if everyone in the district was going to take the test electronically. Um, given the constraints coming from the state in terms of testing schedules, if a mock testing schedule can be created such that it can show that only one school will need to be tested at a time, then testing one elementary school would be enough. If a mock schedule showed that we would have to, if we were doing everybody, have to schedule two schools to be tested at the same time, I want us to test two schools at the same time. Um, this will allow us to better evaluate our readiness and have information with which to form our budget process next year. Second, we need to quickly and clearly communicate to parents and students and staff how the test is being viewed by the school committee and the, and the administration, that we are doing a test of the test this year, mm -hmm. that the results don't matter, and we need to talk it down as best possible. Um, I'm really concerned our parents have not been warned, and they are going to be going, whoa! Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. and <laughs> <laughs> uh, we should also include the new expectation from the state. In this message, we need to convey that the new expectation from the state that the seventh graders and beyond are going to have to pass electronic testing to graduate from high school. Because mm -hmm. um, I think that's mm -hmm. that just kind of the final mm -hmm. thing. And yes, I think he's taken our arms and holding them behind our back, and, yep. and that's totally what he's trying to do. But until he leaves, that's where we are. So, sorry. Thank you, Dr. Allison Happy, Mr. Thielman. That was very helpful. Thanks for that presentation. Um, so, so I'm, I'm, I favor Park. Um, I think this has been a good conversation in Arlington. I think that the conversation with the faculty has been a very good one. I think the faculty, I think the conversation among the principals has been a good one. So I think this process compared to the process of a year and a half ago has been a very good process, very collaborative. Uh, you know, I echo Kiersey's concerns, and uh, I think we sp we put this in the, uh, this is either a goal last year or it's a goal this year, I, but uh, to make sure that our parents are mm -hmm. informed, that there's information sessions, that there's a chance for people to come to a meeting mm -hmm. and ask questions about the park test and what it means. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that's a very important point. I want to... I want to ask a question to get some clarification about electronic versus paper. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> we can have different schools. You, some schools can go park, it can go electronic. Some schools can go um, paper. That's a decision you're going to make based on what's the criteria going to be made to make that decision? Well, what we have said to teachers is, first of all, that um, we would like schools to have a, a strong voice in this process in which they would prefer. We've also have said to teachers that we really are, we are looking at this as a way for everyone to get some practice. And uh, that doesn't mean that we're not gonna look at the results, but the results of our participation in PARC will have no effect on our accountability. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, as Mr. Coleman, Matt Coleman was saying, the comparative results anyway with MCAS have, have just sort of been diminishing and will certainly be diminished this next year. So um, I, I think that message has been given. I, and in fact, Ms. Hansen meant, mentioned that last time we talked about it, that teachers heard that message from us. Laura went and mm -hmm. met with um, all of the teachers that would be grades three, four, and five, and um, that message was conveyed as well. We will certainly need to, um, in either one, give them some experience of what this is like, because it's a new test. I mean, you wouldn't go cold into anything. It doesn't mean that we're prepping for it, but mainly just to get the sense of what the test is. And certainly, that will be true mm -hmm. in electronic. Mm -hmm. um, anecdotally, I can tell you, I we had um, one of the uh, 
deputies from Department of Education come and speak in an EDCO meeting with superintendents today. And uh, much of the information you've already been given. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that was interesting uh, is that the district in EDCO that did the um, park online last year said that the kids liked it a lot. Mm -hmm. yeah. It really did. It was, it, was, it was probably a little bit more of an adjustment for the adults. Mm -hmm. But having said that, I think that we, we do need to test it. We'd like to test the electronic part of it, our, our Wi-Fi capability. Um, we want to do all that. We want to take a look at the test, you know, see what our students think of the test questions, what our teachers do, and see what we need to, uh, to work on. So I think that's, that's a good thing. To, it, the test will help us determine what we need to work on in terms mm -hmm. of instruction. Mm -hmm. um, a concern I have is that if we get to a situation where some elementary schools take the test electronically and some elementary schools take the test on paper, mm -hmm. when they get to the next level, um, it's possible. The kids learn quickly and they adapt quickly and they pick things up. I get that. But <clears throat> it's possible that some students are going to be disadvantaged because they will have not taken a computerized test before middle school or, or wherever. Mm -hmm. I, th that's a possibility. I wouldn't rule it out. But I think that um, one of the things that we find all the time is that the students are very adaptable to the technology. They are, they are. And I we agree. would give this, in that scenario, because you're thinking of sixth grade probably. Right. In that scenario, we would give students exposure to the, the testing tool because it's the only thing fair. You don't want them to go into a test not understanding how you manipulate a screen or get a particular tool off the toolbox. So all that would have to would be done. Okay, I just, I just want to... That was the same training we did last year, uh, two years ago, when mm -hmm. Dallin did the online testing. Yeah. We did training with the students. Um, also at the middle school, we did training with the students. There are sample questions. There are little <coughs> small sample tests. Um, I think it was our intent that should we go park this year and have a division of paper and pencil, that next year our goal would be that everybody would do it online. And so there would be no student that would not have a number of years of experience prior to their having to take it as the graduation requirement in high okay. school. And I think that's the most critical thing. I mean, yes, we always want to have good results, but a competency determination for a student is, you know, that's where we, the 10th grade is where the rubber meets the road and we would make sure that students would have as many experiences as possible prior to getting to 10th grade. Right. right. Okay. Uh, you know, so I'm obviously going to be Supporting Park, I think it's the way to go. I think it's been a very good process in Arlington. The um, Obama administration has said they don't want, their, a goal would be that our students are not spending more than 2% of their time on standardized tests. I think that's the number. So I. We're well within that. Yeah, so We're I'd, well within that. Well, good. Okay, that's good to hear. Mm -hmm. I wanted to hear that. Okay, all right. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Seuss. Uh, yeah, so uh, last year I made the decision to go to stay with MCAS and I based it solely on the question of whether it made sense to do something a year earlier than we needed to. So I wasn't making a statement about whether I liked the test or I liked the direction we were going in or anything like that. Um, I do actually, frankly, like the direction we're going in. I think that MCAS 2.0 will ultimately be a better test. It'll be a better test because it will combine mm -hmm. the best of PARC, plus the Massachusetts knowledge that we've gained through MCAS. We will have control over it. Pearson's not going to be involved. Bunch of good things. Um, so last year my decision was based on three things, basically. Um, one is what teachers were telling us. And at that time, teachers were telling us that they just needed a year break from one new initiative. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that seems like a very reasonable request. And I didn't think that the cost-benefit analysis of waiting that extra year was, was too the, the disadvantage wasn't, wasn't too great. Um, I was also concerned that parents, that it was very late in the process and parents wouldn't have enough time to understand what was happening. That remains a concern this year. And uh, once again, I welcome, I invite you um, to come in a couple weeks mm -hmm. to community relations where hopefully we can work out a strategy mm -hmm. um, to not just have, you know, a couple of memos and one meeting, but really sort of a, a really robust rollout and, and conversation with parents. Um, and the third thing is, is at the time, it seemed very uncertain what was happening. We just really didn't understand what the test would look like, and I think that's changed now. I think we have a much better understanding of what's going to happen. So 
so I'm, I'm going to vote for Park this year. I, I really welcome, actually, frankly, that we this year could potentially be a year to play with the test because it's mm -hmm. not going to be exactly the same test. I don't mm -hmm. believe that it's just going to be exactly Park with uh, something, you know. I think there's going to be enough pushback that it's going to be a better test and not the exact same thing. So, so it actually gives us a little freedom that we can sort of play with this thing without it sort of being the real test. Um, and I would urge that we have no more than two elementary schools do the computerized version. Um, I think there's been a lot of anxiety about the computerized test. And I, the anxiety I've actually heard is certainly around the younger kids. And I know mm -hmm. it would be great to, to just start with fifth grade. And I know we can't do that. Um, but also a question of our limited um, people who can service technology. I mean, that, you know, we sort of the people who are out there are sort of strained as it is. So it, I think it would be advantageous to start small and actually frankly I think if there's enough if there are problems then I think we might want to just you know not go full throttle the next year you know go from two to five or four or whatever I mean mm -hmm. well, we'll see what it obviously we'll see what happens um, yeah so that that's sort of my thoughts okay um, I want to point out one thing is that uh, we are making a decision at the end of December because we weren't even told what the decision could be until the end of November. So that any discussion of doing a lot of meetings prior to this point about what we're going to do, prior to November, we didn't even know what our options were. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, we've pushed back the schedule. I think one of the things that has happened as a result is we've had three good meetings where we have talked about this on camera before the community. Uh, so that the town is aware that we are thinking about this and thinking about this carefully. And it's been an excellent discussion. I'm very proud of this committee. I'm proud of our staff. Uh, I'm proud of everybody who's come forth with really great arguments uh, and, and thoughts about what we should do. Um, the, the test isn't going to count for accountability, but it's going to count in one way, and it's going to provide us information. Mm -hmm. And I think that what we will end up doing is using the information to improve teaching and learning. Um, and nobody should be afraid of this uh, because we are not looking at accountability scores for next year. We're looking to learn from what we're doing and to use the data we will be getting to, to think about is our curriculum aligned? Are we able to do the computerized test? Uh, what do we need to do with kids to uh, have them more uh, able to respond to computerized tests, if that's indeed an issue, or how do we get the adults to be comfortable with uh, uh, computerized testing? Um, I think the experience for the kids in, in, in a district such as ours is a better experience uh, doing the computerized version. I would encourage as many schools as possible to do it electronically because I think the kids will get a better experience. And psychometrically, you have better opportunities to ask questions on a uh, computerized platform than you do on paper and pencil. My analogy would be something like this, is that if I'm thinking of a number between 1 and 100, you'd be guessing 50, then going to 75. You'd be a little iterative in your process, but if it was a pa like a paper and pencil test, you'd have to ask for each number between 1 and 100, and it would have to be a yes, no answer. The, uh, paper and pencil test is essentially a blunt instrument mm -hmm. and there's nuance that you can derive from electronic testing. Um, and the other thing I say is that I'm very impressed with the way the people who work for the Department of Elementary and Ed Secondary Education have been working through this. I share a lot of concerns about the commissioner and uh, about some of the initiatives uh, through the governor and his appointees, but uh, I th the people who I deal with on a regular basis uh, in the psychometric units of DESE have always been committed to be, uh, being as open as possible to developing a good instrument for us that aligns to, to Massachusetts needs and to have this taken out of the consortium and allowing this uh, testing to be a Massachusetts based testing system again I think is a good thing. So I feel good about this vote. I think we're do, uh, I think a, an affirmative vote is the right thing to do. I would 
I am committed to allowing the educators in the, in the district to make the uh, judgment call on paper and pencil versus electronic. I would encourage as many as possible to go electronic because I think the experience will be better. It will be better for the kids and the teachers to try out the electronic version and have years of experience under their belt. But that said, I would will be voting to support the motion. Any further comments at this time, Mr. Hainer? Uh, I would ask the superintendent or the some part of the administration, uh, the updated park communication plan, could you get that with the new dates to us by the next school committee meeting? Oh, absolutely. Thank you. And uh, a tentative date when you think we will go all electronic? Tentative. And what year, what, oh, what year? Yeah. We're hoping next because year. My, my understanding is the current seventh graders are not, we're not going to have that option to give it to them in paper. Mm. That's what it, we're it's going to, when they, when they get to the high school for their, for their, for their that's, requirement. Mm. That's what the Department of Education is right. saying. Right. Now. So, I mean, j just that, that to, the other part is because <clears throat> this is not, we're not being held accountable mm -hmm. uh, on the thing. That communication part to our parents and stuff, when they get the copy back, it's, it's a very tentative thing. When MCAS first came out, and when, they, when I remember telling some high school kids, the high school kids were told, this doesn't count. Mm -hmm. uh, and it did count. Uh, they were trying to ally the anxiety. So there's a balance there that has to be communicated, especially to the parents, for them to understand, we are going to be using this information. Mm -hmm. But the part that is the accountability part as far as the school aspect, but not for the accountability of judging where we are in the curriculum and stuff. Mm -hmm. It's we a balance that I leave to you folks. When we took the pilot, our students took it very seriously. Mm -hmm. And had we been able to get mm -hmm. information from them, I think we would have found the information to be very helpful. Mm -hmm. I, I, I saw no student who did not do his or her best effort. Mm -hmm. I'm less worried about children than I am the parents mm -hmm. in their interpretation. Mm -hmm. of that, that issue of accountability part, we are going to take this information serious that mm -hmm. we get from it. It's just our relationship with the state that is mm -hmm. not, mm -hmm. thank you. Dr. Allison Ampey. Um, I'm thinking about the timing and if, assuming the vote goes part, um, should we have a separate motion to authorize the chair to speak on behalf of the school committee for any messaging that's going out about mm -hmm. the park test? Yeah. Okay, I'll make that after. Okay. On the motion to uh, move to park, uh, we'll do this as a roll call because it's such a momentous vote. Mr. Hainer? I reluctantly. Yes? Yes. Uh, Mr. Pierce? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Aye. Uh, Mr. Thielman? Yes. Uh, Dr. Seuss? Yes. And the chair votes in the affirmative. It's a 6 nothing vote. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey? Um, I move that the full school committee authorize the chair to speak on their behalf in any messaging that goes out over the next month mm -hmm. um, to parents and others about mm -hmm. the park test and you can work with the administration. Second. Any discussion on the motion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? That's a unanimous vote. Thank you very much. And so we've done some important work here tonight. Next important thing, this is Another thing that could have an impact on our future for another 50 years is the uh, Thompson School capacity issues. Dr. Bodie. You have received this week um, the updated numbers uh, from Dr. McKibben mm -hmm. and uh, hot off the presses today, and I believe it probably is in Novus, but we have uh, the, um, the, narr the narrative. So you'll have the updated um, information mm -hmm. from um, Dr. McKibben in terms of mm -hmm. what were the different factors that um, he analyzed over the last couple of weeks mm -hmm. in conjunction with um, our, our changed enrollment numbers, our, mm -hmm. our, our enrollment numbers from this year, mm -hmm. which represent um, a change from what was mm -hmm. forecasted both by Dr. McKibben as well as our own um, uh, projections. But he has uh, an explanation for that, which I'll let I know really you didn't get this very far before between before mm -hmm. this meeting. So uh, mm -hmm. there will be an opportunity um, to read it and to have a chance to ask him questions. 
But one of the things that uh, remains, ac well, remains in his forecast is looking at our elementary schools um, over the next five, ten years. And Thompson and Hardy are both going to have very mm -hmm. high numbers, are going to be approaching 500 and be sustained mm -hmm. at that. They'll be in the high, high 400s. Mm -hmm. um, now, these are only forecasts. You know, you, you, as you, we saw this year, I mean, things can change. There's so many things in the economy, uh, just, just the world that can have an effect on this. But clearly, we need to be planning for larger, uh, for more classrooms for both Thompson, which is a more immediate need, mm -hmm. and for Hardy in the next few years. What you also see in the numbers is that really for all of our other elementary schools, they are going to remain pretty flat. In fact, one of the things that was a little bit of a surprise with the adjusted numbers is that Brackett hit its high point right now and probably will go down somewhat over the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that the school is not still large. You know, when you're having 450, 460 students in a school, mm -hmm. it's a large school. Mm -hmm. So we still are going to need to be thinking about make, making sure we have um, adequate space, uh, space at bracket. But in terms of probably needing to add classrooms, certainly mm -hmm. at any of our other elementary schools in the next um, mm -hmm. five, 10 years, at least in this, this um, re, uh, new forecast, the answer is no. So that comes back to Thompson. What, what will be the right uh, pathway? And there are, there are a few options, and they really haven't changed since we began this discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the options is, of course, to add on space. And that space can be permanent, or and when I say use the word permanent, I mean an addition to the building, mm -hmm. or having an addition to the building which is a permanent, stackable, modular classrooms. At the, another possibility uh, would be to be somehow taking some of the Thompson students and moving them to um, another, uh, another facility, another building. At the, at the last task force, meet, force meeting, there was discussion about, well, maybe what about going out of town? And um, that was something that was presented. And, and I, and I don't think that that really is a viable option. I, it's certainly one that I would not support. Uh, mm -hmm. There was also suggestions about maybe moving uh, one class to a Gibbs building. And that one, that suggestion also is a little problematic in that, as you've heard, and I think the public has heard this evening, uh, education is very much more complicated in that students need a lot of support. Um, many students have uh, learning special support in pull-out classes. They have reading support. They have ELL, OT, PT, speech and language. And if you move a class, how do you move all the specialists? Um, do the specialists come there on a part-time basis? Do they do we bring the kids back to school? It's, it's very problematic. Mm -hmm. In taking one class out, so frankly, I, I, it's it's a an option that I could not support. Another idea that has surfaced uh, in the last uh, week or so is, since we will have next year capacity at Pierce, uh, a suggestion has come forward to bus one class to Pierce next year. We do have the infrastructure of all of the different services in place. We'd have to re, you know, redistribute probably a little bit within the district. Um, and th this partic the particular class is a class that has had a number of transitions as they've gone through their elementary experience, having been uh, in, different, in different buildings. Mm -hmm. it, it's not, it, it's certainly an option that's preferable to going out of district. Mm -hmm. The other issue with Thompson is what we're going to do next year. Mm -hmm. And one possibility would be to have uh, modular, temporary modular classrooms there so we could um, have additional space for classrooms. So there really aren't that many. It really comes down to are we going to, are we, when would we add additional classrooms onto Thompson? 
and what form would they be? And, or on a very temporary Band-Aid model, would we move a par portion of, of the school to another locale? So, that, so th those are the options. There's not many, really. Now, one option that, that we talked about before is that we do have a buffer zone between Hardy and Thompson. And I do think that it, it would be wise to widen that for, for more flexibility to the two schools mm -hmm. that are, are experiencing this enrollment mm -hmm. growth. And that is something that we would have to do here at the committee, and we can take it to subcommittee, look at it, have, have parents come in, as we did very much with the last process. It was a process, and uh, it wouldn't be done unilaterally, but it would go through a process. But I think it is one that we, we seriously need to look at. Mm -hmm. So. I know that you, the question you asked, mm -hmm. Dr. Seuss, tonight about what, what about the core spaces mm -hmm. if we added classrooms on? And um, I mean, it's a very valid question. And what can we do about the additional need for phys ed? I mean, that's really where the issue is, is the phys ed. Um, in the cafeteria, the way it's designed and, 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 uh, and um, Ms. Donato would continue is to have the way she, she doesn't do three seatings, she does five and probably will go to six next year. Mm -hmm. That does mean some kids eat early mm -hmm. and that means some kids would eat later and there would be a need for some kind of snack clearly mm -hmm. in, that, in that kind of model. But that, that model of having individual classes only in the, in the lunchroom fits another educational of um, priority and that, well, based on research is that students will, will sit down and eat lunch if you have lunch followed by, preceded by recess rather than the other way around, mm -hmm. which is the way we did it for years. But more and more our elementary schools to the extent that they can are trying to have uh, recess before lunch. Mm -hmm. And so in that model, and actually we have, as you know, Ms. Foley here tonight who is a Thompson, Thompson teacher. But it, there is a feeling that every square inch of the building is being used, mm -hmm. and so having some additional space mm -hmm. uh, would be something that would be quite welcome. I was there yesterday, and, and the after-school program originally had a dedicated room. Now, this is a luxury, because not all our schools have a dedicated after-school room. Mm -hmm. huh? Just one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We had one, mm -hmm. and, but uh, what happens is that, you know, mm -hmm. we have a tiny office now for that, but, the, you know, the kids mm -hmm. spread out through the whole building. Their kids were everywhere in the building for the after-school program, and mm -hmm. um, it would be nice to have even more space mm -hmm. uh, to keep their supplies together. So when you're asking about what the capacity question is, mm -hmm. the question is what is the direction we need to go? What is the recommended direction. My, my recommendation and is at this point, after we've gone through a lot of discussion, a lot of processes, that we have a permanent addition mm -hmm. built onto Thompson. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the money for doing stackable portables um, are not, it's not that much different. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to have, these are going to start in 10 years, 15 years, going to mm -hmm. not be, have the integrity of, a, of, a, of an addition. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that is my recommendation. Now, having said that, there's an issue of money mm -hmm. and when we would have a debt exclu exclusion mm -hmm. on this. And it may be, and this is some discussions going on, that we would not have the money identified to actually go into the planning process of it. Um, and that, that's something that we'd have to think about is, is how that would actually happen. But I would also recommend, I would like to, I would prefer to see two modulars at, at Thompson next year. But if that's not possible, I certainly have a, a strong plan B that would deal with the enrollment growth next year. Mr. Hainer. I support what the superintendent has just recommended, the mm -hmm. idea of an addition on to Thompson. Mm -hmm. That deals with half of our issues. Mm -hmm. uh, we're talking about Thompson right now. And the idea of supporting mm -hmm. the module uh, temp temporary to alleviate the problem. Uh, 
My only concern with this is, is and you started to address it at the end, uh, the timing aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I thought, and I, I'll stand corrected, there was some <sighs> feeling that they might be bundled for the whole for the Thompson thing for the 25th of January the temporary and the long range and yes, it's uh, possible. I would support that uh, but again there's a timing thing that requires if we're going to have a vote it might have to be tonight or a side vote on the 7th of if we're all together on the, on the 7th I don't know that's a timing thing and I threw the chair back to Dr. Bodie yeah I think you'd be okay on the 14th. Um, I think you would be all right on the 14th okay. to take this up. Um, in fact, Finance Committee might not be able to meet until after that date. Um, so th this looking at that. Now, next week we have a, a task force meeting. Right. And with more discussion, I'm certainly going to, I've already passed on the numbers. I will pass on the narrative to the task force group so they have it. Mm -hmm. Selectman will have it, and it will be public. It's in Novus, mm -hmm. so everybody can see these, mm -hmm. uh, see mm -hmm. these numbers. Mm -hmm. But um, one of the things that um, I know the agenda item is just about Thompson, but it's mm -hmm. it's there's a much bigger picture of the whole issue mm -hmm. with Addison, and mm -hmm. the more we talk about it, it really hinges what's going to happen here. Mm -hmm. You know, we really need mm -hmm. that in the equation to know what what mm -hmm. the next the mm -hmm. steps are with respect to the middle school. Yeah. Mr. Pierce. Two quick questions, hopefully quick. Um, when it was built, was it built with the idea that at some point there was space, there was some area to put an extension? And mm -hmm. uh, second question might be so fantasy realm, but I must ask, um, would this be something that we would go to the MSBA and say, look, you know, <laughs> You told us <laughs> you would only do this much because this is what we were showing two, three years ago. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, warranty of habitability. You know, <laughs> it's not worn out. It's not run out yet. You know, yeah. it's not habitable anymore. Well, when we went into negotiations with MSBA, mm -hmm. one of the districts, our strong recommendation to MSBA was to have a bigger school than Mm -hmm. the previous Thompson. And we talk about bigger school, we were, talk, mm -hmm. we were talking about classrooms. Mm -hmm. We wanted to have three classrooms per grade, which mm -hmm. was not the case at the old Thompson, mm -hmm. and have four at kindergarten. Mm -hmm. and, they, uh, the, and they agreed to doing that, but then that's what triggered having to do redistricting. Mm -hmm. um, because they, weren't, they didn't think that we would have enough students to justify mm -hmm. 19 classrooms. And our numbers would at that time would have said just that because we were we were in t we had a f we we saw from 2000 to about 2010 it was jagged but it was basic basically a trajectory of growth but when we hit 2010 we went off and we and, and, and for the next year we flattened out and so that's exactly when we were talking with MSBA in that flattened out period, and they didn't see that we were going to need ni beyond 19 classrooms. They right. just didn't. Mm -hmm. And so we walked away from that with at least getting the 19 classrooms. Now, would we have liked to have more? Yeah. No. Yes, we wanted to have more, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But um, we were also at that year, just to put this all in perspective, that was when we were looking at a, of an override for the general fund. Mm -hmm. and how can we do both, build the school and have, mm -hmm. and have a general override be successful? Mm -hmm. um, having two override votes in a year was not, was not going to probably be successful for one of them. So, and possibly two, we didn't know. So mm -hmm. everyone was doing their very best they could to make this possible, but, but I felt, and other people felt as well, that educationally it is far better to have three grades per class mm -hmm. because students have an option to have regroupings, you know, not just the two. Mm -hmm. And um, so that we were able to get that. Mm -hmm. and, and unfortunately, well, it depends how you look at it. I mean, we're seeing a great enrollment mm -hmm. growth, but 19 isn't enough. Mm -hmm. What we really need now is um, we need to have 24. 24. That's mm -hmm. where we are. Mm -hmm. Dr. Allison Um 
I'm looking at a Google map view of the Thompson. I'm just wondering, is it possible to have both temporary modulars and permanent construction going on at the same time? Th that is something that we're concerned about. Um, it's it where, where, where the issue is isn't the two in the in the parking lot possibly it's that if we had to put two additional for that that year where can we position them so we wouldn't be in the construction area right so there are some finances that need to be worked out and planning that would take mm -hmm. place but i do think that that in fact we're mm -hmm. talking about that today um and mm -hmm. have been talking about it how to how to actually set up the campus to do it. Thank you. Mr. Thielman. So uh, I'm glad this is the recommendation because I think it's the right thing to do, mm -hmm. to add permanent space, mm -hmm. to add six classrooms, that's the plan? Mm -hmm. Add six classrooms to the Thompson School, potentially some common space that has to be studied, is that right? Or? That's not the recommendation. Mm -hmm. see. I mean, see if that's we possible. Need the five classrooms. <clears throat> We need the five classrooms. Yep. That sixth classroom could serve as additional space for any number of purposes. Okay, so we have to do some planning and, mm -hmm. and we have to do. So the, yeah. the question mm -hmm. that I have is we have a, a school enrollment task force meeting on the 22nd next Tuesday night. Mm -hmm. And so are, we recomm are you recommending at that meeting that this permanent addition? Okay, so that's going to be so. And then we have to prepare for a town meeting vote and then a debt exclusion. Would that debt exclusion be part of the high school debt exclusion if we're successful or not? Have you thought that through? You um, I actually inquired about it a little bit. It could, could. be. It could be. You, okay. you could, the actual vote doesn't, You, because I did look into that a little bit. The vote itself doesn't have to have a number in it. Okay. But when did it before, uh, you in, in how you communicate about it, you, you, you need to have a number out there, probably. In the marketing materials, you need to have a number. Yes, but in the vote itself, you don't have a number. We're going to, so the vote is to build an extension to the Thompson School and maybe do something with the high well, school. Well, we've got, we've yeah. got uh, lots of enrollment growth issues. We haven't even begun to deal with Audison. Yeah. We have the high school, of course, and we have Minuteman. Yeah. So it's it, it's possible to put all four? You, you can, if, yes. Okay, good. Yes. That's what I wanted to understand. We can put all four in one vote. It's for all enrollment growth. You can you word it in separate, such a way. Separate votes. And you could, no, and you can do it retroactively so that okay. if you spent the money now, you can then later on exempt okay. the, uh, yeah. the payments. So I think the one thing that we need to get some clarity about between now and, you know, the, f the next time we meet as, a, meet as a full committee on January 14th is, you know, what we're proposing, what the warrant's going to, how the warrant's going to read at town meeting so that we take a favorable vote on it as a committee. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dr. Mm -hmm. um, so the problems that, or the challenges at Thompson um, are permanent challenges. Mm -hmm. We're not, you know, if we were talking about a couple of years of problems, there's all sorts of things mm -hmm. we can consider. Sending kids one place for a couple mm -hmm. of years, no problem. Mm -hmm. But in, your, in a year and a half, it's going to be 100 kids over capacity, mm -hmm. 480 is the projection. Mm -hmm. Go up to 500, you know, drop down to 480. So and for, for the foreseeable f future, for a very long time. So I'm very mm -hmm. concerned that we get the, the structure right mm -hmm. and that we don't go back in three years and say, oh my God, we didn't think of this, right? Mm -hmm. so, um, so I would encourage us to look at common space. One of the cheapest ways is maybe to take one of these classrooms and turn it into a music room, maybe soundproof it properly mm -hmm. and so that you can use the back of the gym space as an additional, so that's much bigger space mm -hmm. than, a, you know, than a, a classroom would be. Um, but I don't want to make a decision now that we will come to regret. Mm -hmm. And I think that the timing, it sounds like the gen if we do a vote in January, it doesn't constrain us, but we need to be, get the messaging right. Mm -hmm. If for some reason in 2017, or is that what, next year? Yeah, 2017, we open and the classrooms aren't quite ready because we were really being careful about it, but they're a few months out of, out of the way. I don't think that's a terrible thing because I think what we need is a really good permanent solution. Mm -hmm. And I would hate to feel rushed and come up with something that we regretted soon. Mm -hmm. I think there, there are a couple of strengths that we have going here. We've maintained a good relationship with the Thompson Architects and they know the building. We've got the as-drawn plans. Uh, 
they laid out the building with an eye towards being able to run six classrooms out that way. Uh, and given the quality of the work that they did for us on the main building, I have no doubt that if we ask them to d design it with uh, one of the classroom areas being more common space or something that could be used for, for multiple purposes, they could do, uh, come up with some really nice ideas of how to do it and how to incorporate that into, in, into, the, uh, into the addition. Um, I am very happy to hear the superintendent making this recommendation to go for a permanent uh, building because I think that uh, temporary portables isn't going to do it and uh, the population in the east is growing to the point. The community has changed. People want to live in, the, in, in East Arlington with kids the, you know, the, the whole generational change, folks are willing to sacrifice space for community. And when they do that, they're looking for the amenities. They're looking for the quality of experience that they have here in Arlington. That's not going to change unless we do something to, 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 to break it. And I think the best thing we can do, it, it, it's going to last 50 years. We're going to need it in the long term. Um, it's the first piece of the puzzle. We know we need to do this. There are other decisions that we need to make later, but this one, is, I, I, I favor moving forward as quickly as possible to put uh, the addition on. Mr. <laughs> oh, uh, let, let, I'm going to ask Ms. Foley, who works with us <laughs> and works in that building, uh, if you'd like to make a comment. Uh, wow. Um, well, first of all, yes, every, every I, I kind of find it amusing that um, there had to be a tour yesterday to find out if every available space was being used in our school yesterday because <laughs> I can tell you every available space well, I, is I know being that used too. in our <laughs> store. I know you weren't the one who, who, um, who was asking that, but I, yes, um, you know, you can come at any point during the day mm -hmm. and you are going to see our third floor hallway crowded with students working out in the hallway because they cannot fit into the classroom in the fifth grade classrooms with 29 and 30 students. Um, so they are out in the hallway doing a lot of their work. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, every available space is being used. Uh, stairwells, mm -hmm. everything. So we're at capacity. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I, I would personally love, I think a permanent structure added on to, um, a permanent addition added on to our building is the way to go. I mean, it, everything that I've heard and seen we're going to keep growing. Mm -hmm. Even if, let's say, our numbers go down and we have two empty classrooms, those two empty classrooms are not, not going to be wasted. Mm -hmm. not be empty. They are going <laughs> to be used. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they will, they will never be empty, empty classrooms in our, in our building. Um, they're going to have find some kind of purpose. Um, space is pretty much the one thing mm -hmm. we're always looking for right now. So mm -hmm. I'm, very, I'm very pleased to hear that the majority seem to support the idea of an addition. We're, we're, and, and we're glad you're here to uh, offer your perspective. Thank you. Mr. Hainer? I guess I, I would ask the committee to discuss briefly uh, if we want to come to some sort of consensus to direct the, the members that are on that enrollment committee. I think taking a vote on the 14th of January is appropriate, but mm -hmm. I don't want the enrollment committee th thinking we haven't got it together or we don't have an idea of where we want. I, th I got the feeling that they were asking us give them some sort of direction. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I agree that the, the Audison thing may not be, we may not be mm -hmm. gelled on that yet, but from what I'm hearing, there seems to be some sort of a consensus. I'm not saying we're going to go in with the vote. So you're making a motion to endorse the superintendent's recommendation uh, to add permanent construction at the Thompson. So moved. Second. Okay. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey. Um, I'm sort of, I guess I'm on a slightly different topic. Um, I just wanted, I think if people had watched our last meeting and then this meeting, it seems like we've gone from one thing to something totally mm -hmm. different. And I wanted to explain to them mm -hmm. um, that part of the reason is that we've received an update in the, enroll, in, in the enrollment forecast report. Mm -hmm. And it explains why we saw somewhat decreased enrollment in certain areas that he had projected formally. And um, the whole recast says that the district is, our elementary school population today is 2,924. 
and will peak in like 20, 19, 20, 20 um, at 3,064. So we're not looking at a scenario that shows all of our schools being as overcrowded mm -hmm. as we were expecting under the first set of forecast. Um, and so that's made us push, pull away from the idea of like pulling all the fifth grades out and mm -hmm. putting them someplace and, and focusing more on the areas in the east where we're seeing the majority of the growth. Um, that said, um, I think I'm going to abstain from voting for the motion that Mr. Hayner made just because I haven't had a chance to look at these numbers. I know Mr. McKibben's coming tomorrow. I'm planning to come to attend that meeting to hear it, but I just, I need to see them and think about them to see if I agree and, and stuff. Okay, so Mr. Thielman. So the, the facility subcommittee met yesterday and we had a chance to talk through some of the McKibben numbers and <clears throat> what the McKibben, what, what the report told us is that uh, the increase in enrollment uh, is 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 consistent as far as the eye can see at um, is consistent with the initial projections are very close to it as far as the eye can see at the Thompson and the Hardy, mm -hmm. and so what we've seen is a a move of people to mm -hmm. East Arlington uh, who like living there for many many reasons mm -hmm. access to public transportation uh, and and other other uh, things and so. Um, that seems to be uh, as far as the eye can see. So it necessitates us to take action. The school that's most crowded now is the Thompson. If we uh, have a bigger buffer zone um, mm -hmm. for a period of time, we can, uh, we can take some uh, hardy students and put them in the Thompson. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's, this is a good solution. Mm -hmm. So we still have to, do, I mean, the task force still has to talk about the Addison Middle School. We still have to get the news from the MSBA. Mm -hmm. But for now, I, th I, think, um, I think that the superintendent's recommendation is a good one. I respect the need to go and do some more research, but I think it's pretty solid. And I think it's, I don't think it's another solution. I, I, I agree. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, no matter what else we end up doing, we need to add capacity in the East, and we're going to need it for a long time. Yeah. Um, and this is an advisory vote. We're not endorsing a plan, but I think that the, the position that we're stating right now is given the information we have tonight and looking forward, that we're going to need to have additional capacity in the East. Uh, there are other things we can do later on that might involve some redistricting, might involve some uh, temporary portables in various locations, but in terms of permanent infrastructure, this is going to become a necessary part of our mix, uh, regardless of what we do. So that's why I'm glad to have the motion before us and give us the ability to make direct the superintendent, uh, Dr. Seuss. Oh, I just have a clarification. Is the um, motion for the six classrooms only with no extra common space, or is the motion just permanent in general? In general. It was a general to endorse an uh, temporary potentially temporary modules uh, for next year and a permanent addition without specificity. We're, we're pointing the direction to a permanent addition. Yeah, That's so what the motion does. It's, it's, just, it's, just, not, just it's to not, be, not a total plan. Mm -hmm. so just to be clear how the process works, mm -hmm. you, we, you, once we do this, then there needs to be a feasibility study mm -hmm. to find out what's, what's feasible. That's mm -hmm. all that happens at yeah. this point. Yeah. And then the feasibility study mm -hmm. involves multiple stakeholders. It involves an architect. It involves all of us. It involves a number of different scenarios and options with costs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're not there yet. Mm -hmm. No. Okay, this, so we're not we, specifying. Yeah. That. No. We'll if find I mean, out what we can do. Yeah. Mr. The, the, Mr. Hayner. From what I'm hearing is that to solve the initial problem for East Arlington, mm -hmm. we're looking at this as a potential solution mm -hmm. and not at Gibbs or not moving kids to mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Minuteman or to Medford. Mm -hmm. Those are some of the things that we would thinking out of the box the other night, which I think it was a good idea. This is a direction mm -hmm. to, to look at. That, mm -hmm. That's what I'm getting out of this. And as Jeff, yeah. excuse me, Mr. Thelman just said, that uh, the, mm -hmm. the nitty gritty comes later once a, a, a plan is, uh, a direction is finalized. A logical first step. We may find out once we ask 
uh, what this would entail and what it would look like and what the logistics are and what we could get out of this uh, uh, might surprise us. But I think that given the information we have at this point in time, it's a logical first step. Uh, hearing no other discussion on Mr. Hainer's motion, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, abstain? Aye. Okay, so it's five, nothing with one abstention. Thank you. Uh, superintendent's report. You'd be relieved to know I don't have much. Oh, no, I'm sorry, I missed one thing here. Oh. Uh, uh, vote to hold a special okay. school committee meeting on Thursday, January 7th, 2016 at Town Hall. That's at 7 o'clock? 7 o'clock. 7 yes. o'clock. Uh, motion by Dr. Sue, second by Mr. Pierce. Uh, any discussion? It's two hours, so it's 7 to 9. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you, can I just say Go ahead. a couple words? 7 uh, p.m. So, um, the draft agenda that you have in front of you mm -hmm. is pretty close to what it's going to look like, but we are going to finesse some details to just sort of a couple of the topics may shift around a little bit, renamed or mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. but, but basically, this is the idea. It's going to be interactive. We're going to have tables with small group discussions. Mm -hmm. um, that information is going to be brought to the front or entered in iPads. Um, and, you know, will it do, I mean, we're not going to solve a problem that night, right? Mm -hmm. But we are going to to reach out to the community, mm -hmm. to um, find out what people are thinking, mm -hmm. to educate them about what we know so far, um, to hear their concerns, and that is really valuable. And so it's just part mm -hmm. of this public conversation mm -hmm. that I think is incredibly valuable. Excellent. Um, you'll be running the meeting? And I will be partially running the meeting, but I will actually um, be asking several other people to mm -hmm run parts of it, and um, that will be figured out in the next few days. Excellent. Okay. Uh, any other questions, comments, discussion on the motion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous vote. Now we go to superintendent's report. Well, I, as I said, I don't really have too much. It's only been a week. Um, I do want to compliment <coughs> the, uh, both the Audison and the high school music department. Once again, they just have um, had extraordinary concerts. Uh, both at middle school had the instrumental uh, this week and the choral on Wednesday night, and then last week was the high school. And um, they they honestly are are quite superb. And I would invite actually more of the public to come and hear them. Um, though I will say that you'll have a hard time finding a seat because <laughs> a lot of people will come, but they're, they're, they're truly exceptional. Um, I also wanted you to be aware, uh, I don't, just more of a, an awareness of uh, it's a discussion that's going on with the Middlesex League superintendents. And we've, we have st started actually set, set up some regular meetings, but the, one of the, the, the topic of a discussion this week was looking at, in the league, high school start times. Mm -hmm. um, there is growing, there's growing evidence in terms of brain research around adolescents that later starts in the day are probably better educationally for them. Now, there's also mm -hmm. a, a myriad of comp complexity in mm -hmm. terms of trying to, to do that. So there's no recommendation yet coming forward, but I just want you to know that those kind of discussions are going mm -hmm. on. And maybe, I don't know if you'd want to, mm -hmm. you know, include that. That's a good idea. Mm -hmm. That's a great idea. And mm -hmm. thinking about it. Now, what, one thing that is interesting is that I think we have the, late, the latest start time yeah. in the Middlesex League. Mm -hmm. And, of course, by having the league superintendents talk, we're, we're taking athletics mm -hmm. out of the issue because you often hear later start, so it's complicated by athletics. This, this, this mm -hmm. discussion. Oh, if everyone's doing it. Every, it's yeah. the whole league. It's mm -hmm. the whole league dis different. discussing mm -hmm. this. And so we'll meet again, I think it was, I mm -hmm. forget, it's later January. And, and, and at some point I will be you know, bringing a recommendation mm -hmm. that it will be a joint recommendation mm -hmm. from this group. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you. And um, just uh, the other thing, is one of the things on the agenda I just want you to be aware of what we'll have in January is the calendar, voting the calendar start dates and so forth in January. And there's also discussion going on with respect to setting out uh, start dates for the, the two years after that too. So mm -hmm. we'll be working on that. 
And anybody who would like to see the, the new um, forecast, the updated forecast from Dr. McKibben, it is now a public document, and um, mm -hmm. they can, uh, Ms. Fitzgerald, can you tell people how they can access it? Thank Can you. we also get a special link to that on the front of the page? Yes, yeah. we'll, yeah. we'll get them. We'll get yeah. that on the front page mm -hmm. too mm -hmm. on the website. And that's it. Okay. Uh, subcommittee and liaison reports, policies and procedures, Mr. Pierce. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we'll be meeting on January 11th, a 15. Uh, we'll be discussing uh, the new student restraint uh, revisions uh, to update our policy accordance with state law mm -hmm. and uh, uh, continuing with the business uh, that we had at our last session. Mm -hmm. You'll be discussing principal salary policy? That is one of those items, yes. Okay, thank, thank you very you. much for reminding me yeah. of that. What's mm -hmm. the date? January 11th. Um, anything else, Mr. Pierce? Announcements? No. Nope. Uh, budget, Dr. Allison Ampey. Budget will meet tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. and we'll be discussing super um, substitute pay and also how to present the various data that we've been talking about. Facilities. Uh, is somebody making a facilities report? Mr. Thielman, you did a you great the job meeting. yesterday. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, you know, I, I included draft underscore minutes, but mm -hmm. I mean, pretty much what Dr. Bodie said tonight is a summary of where we're at mm -hmm. as a subcommittee. Um, so we, I think Bill and Cindy and I understand that the director from the committee is as follows. We support a Thompson permanent addition. Mm -hmm. Generally, we don't have a specific uh, mm -hmm. plan. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to look at uh, mo modulars at the uh, Thompson next year. Um, and we took a straw poll of the committee mm -hmm. at the last meeting saying we favor neighborhood schools. Mm -hmm. That's a value mm -hmm. of ours. And that's it, really. Mm -hmm. from the, and we, because we haven't come to a conclusion about anything else, mm -hmm. about the Addison Middle School, the Gibbs School, long term, whether that can mm -hmm. be converted back to a, mm -hmm. a middle school, that's it. So that's, those are really the three directors we have from the school committee and the rest of the, and then we'll report, report back and keep, keep uh, reporting back. The, the School Enrollment Task Force meets this 22nd, the 5th, and the uh, 12th, I think. Mm -hmm. So we have three meetings. Mm -hmm. before the, the full school committee meets again on the 14th, mm -hmm. so aware. Mm -hmm. so. We have a facilities meeting but, tomorrow afternoon also. Mm -hmm. Well, Dr. McKibben's making a presentation. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That, that is technically a meeting of the subcommittee, right? right. It's posted? Yeah, yeah it's yes. posted. There may not, I'm, yeah, not yes, sure, I'm not sure I'm going to make it. So, <laughs> so um, Chair, if, I'm, if I may, I just have to excuse myself because I'm going downstairs to pick up Tiny Tim from uh, rehearsal. Okay. And bring him tomorrow home. Tomorrow night, 730. Tomorrow night, 730, and yes. Saturday, 11, 3, and 730. Here's selling tickets. Yes, I've got a lot of tickets <laughs> in case you need them. Just email me. My email's on the website. Thank you very much. Uh, happy holidays to all. Thank you very much for these goodies. Happy holidays to all and to all. Good night. Thank you very much. <laughs> telling you you going to I'm going to give this to my son. <laughs> I'll eat it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Tiny Tim will appreciate this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, District Accountability Curriculum Instruction Assessment, Mr. Thielman. You know, we, we had a meeting a week or so ago, and uh, we'll meet after the everything with the facilities work is complete. So after probably after, not going to meet again until after town meeting. Community Relations, we voted the next meeting. Uh, yes, we did. Uh, so we met, what was it, last Monday? Mm -hmm. and. Um, had a long discussion, I have to learn to watch the, count, the clock better, um, on um, the details of this meeting and some input from, from community as well, and lots of great ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, we also discussed, oh, we also had Stacy Smith, who is an Arlington resident, a parent, and of Consensus Building Institute, and she has graciously volunteered uh, her time and expertise on this. Um, we also uh, approved sort of a, a summary of the um, parent survey that we did last year, and so I'd like to present it at some point when we have time. Excellent. Um, and talked about doing a survey to both parents and teachers at the same time on things like start times and uh, other issues surrounding the calendar to sort of just get the community's feeling. Teachers and, and, been, and you've been working on arranging a meeting with our legislative delegation. Yes, and I've been working on arranging a meeting with le our legislative de delegation. Um, the 14th looks like it's the best date for mm -hmm. people. I'm just confirming that. Good. So if that works for, for you and 
everyone else. I know you've been tracing down people, and I appreciate yep, yep. that. Um, Executive session minute review subcommittee, Mr. Hainer. I wish to apologize to the committee after harassing former members of not coming through. I have neglected it. I have it's on my schedule to contact council tomorrow morning. Okay. Uh, warrant committee. Everyone got paid. Uh, school enrollment tax for task force. I already reported out. We already reported out. Uh, and we went past the uh, yeah. consent agenda. Oh, I see. Yeah. Um, this paper stuff just is just ridiculous. Uh, I should be following <laughs> the electronic version. But I've been doodling on the paper. Consent agenda, all items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Approval of warrant, uh, uh, accounts payable warrant number 16087, dated 12-10-2015, total warrant amount 675-555-54. At six hundred seventy-five thousand five hundred fifty-five dollars and fifty-four cents, approval of the minutes. So, oh, no minutes. Oh, minutes. no just minutes. So it's just the warrant. Yeah. I, 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 so said, I said too much. I could have just okay. said move the warrant. Uh, motion by Mr. Hainer, second by Dr. Allison Ampey. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed. Uh, we're, any further announcements? No, Mr. Hainer. Just one quick one. Uh, I, I wasn't able to say it. Uh, the Stratton uh, third graders had their town meeting. Okay. They passed two out of three articles. It was a wonderful time. And uh, how's the polar punch plunge? Still going forward, weather, weather permitting. It's going to be uh, so warm. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 well, it's set for January 23rd. I'm, it's going to be like the, balmy. The big, the big worry <laughs> is that. The snow dump in Gloucester will be uh, filled again and they'll postpone it. But the, we, Rotary right now has three members that are going. Two of the members are over 70. Mm -hmm. I'm one of them. And uh, potentially with uh, a faculty member is indicated from the high school, he will be attending. And he, he thinks he, there may be two students that might be attending as well. To raise money for polio, so you're going to have palm trees out there on the beach. No, <laughs> no, it's going to be cold. Um, motion to adjourn by uh, Dr. Seuss, second by Mr. Hainer. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And we're done. Okay.